Our next broadcast is a science fiction drama series that was broadcast from April 24th, 1955 to January 9th, 1958 in various time slots on NBC. Known for its high production values and adapting stories from the leading American authors of the era, it has been described as one of the finest offerings of American radio drama and one of the best science fiction series in any form and medium. We present to you X-1 on Hojo Radio. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions for Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope. And then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space, angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands. And the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, Park Hill. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildly? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, you could get drunk on it. Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle of Alibrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done until we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martians? Sender, you're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's the kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors. And from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife-edged double shadows on the desert. All right, come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got these, Jackie? Sawdust, smothered in cold chicken fat. Good, I thought it was something I couldn't eat. (laughs) Hey, Captain, Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain, Captain Wilder. Oh, yes, over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well... Most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over... What about it? People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. 
We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. What did they die of? You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Now think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. Uh, you need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hold it out. Hey, hey, hey. How about a case, hey? Good Lord. They have to do that now? Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. A little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> Yahoo! Twenty bottles were opened and drunk. The voices got louder. The earth laughs and shouts echoing across the empty Martian sands. Spender listened to the wind over his ears, cool and whispering. He felt the land getting cooler. The stars drew closer, very near. The air smelled clean and new. He looked at the cool ice of the white Martian buildings over there on the empty sea lands. <laughs> Oh, hey, what do we do with these empty bottles? Save them, stupid. There's a two cents deposit. Ah! <laughs> Throw them away. Hey, wait. Wait. How about that building? Two to one on a buck, I can heave one right through that window. You're wrong. All right, here it goes. Hey! Oh, God. Hey, double or nothing on the next shot. Put that bottle down, Biggs. Who's there, Mr. Spender? Stop smashing those windows. What's the difference? The planet's ours now. I guess I can do anything with it I want. Drop that bottle or I'll knock your teeth out. Yeah? Hey, just watch me. I warned you, big... Come on, come on. Hey, what's going on here? Spender! Spender! I hit him. He's crazy, Captain. He just walked up and slugged me. All right, thanks. Spender, you come with me. Now, suppose you explain. What was the idea of... The noise, the drunken brawl. Friend of the men are tired. This has been a long trip. And you have a different way of seeing things. Oh, I'm seeing things, all right. I'm seeing how we'll ruin Mars. We'll rip it up and rip the skin off the way we've already ruined Earth. Is that why you hit Big? Yes. I couldn't stand the idea of them watching us make fools of ourselves. Damn. The Martians. They're dead. They're all dead. But they know we're here. Doesn't an old thing always know when a new thing comes? We've come a long way to smash their windows and spit in their wine. Well, maybe you're right. But I'm still going to fine you $50 for that fight. Now, come on, Spender. Suck in your chin. We'll go back there and play happy. Now they moved out into the moonlight across the desert. They made their way into the dreaming, dead city. The light of the racing twin moons glinted on the barrel of a pistol, the long blade of a machete, the round, gurgling shape of a raised bottle. The wind blew in from the dead sea bottom and brushed through the silvery wire filigree of the towers. Strange music drifted down to the double shadowed streets. A thin, haunted music that played as it had played through the uncounted years of time. Nobody moved. The moons held and froze them. The wind beat slowly around them. Hey! Hey, you people in the city! 
pigs. I just want to make a little noise. What kind of a celebration is this, anyway? Come on. They built this city thousands of years ago. And now where are they? How did they die? Who cares? They're dead. That's good enough for me. Lord Byron. What? Lord Byron, a 19th century poet. He wrote a poem that fits this city. Might have been written by the last Martian poet. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving, though the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul outwears its breast. And the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the earthmen stood in the center of the city. It was a clear night. There was not a sound except the music of the wind. At their feet lay a tile court, worked into the shapes of ancient animals and images. They stood there, silvered by the double moons beneath the crystal towers of Mars. And then Biggs was sick, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. And Spender turned and walked away into the city, alone in the moonlight, never once stopping to look back. It was a morning that might have been a Monday, or a Tuesday, or any day on Mars. Biggs was on the canal rim, his feet hung down in the cool water, soaking, while he took the sun in his face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Biggs? Didn't you go out with the search party? Yeah. I come back. I got a blister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? Look. Look, Cherokee. See that? Uh, anyway, I had enough searching. Four days hunting for that screwball spender. Didn't find him yet, huh? Oh, uh, good riddance. Oh, my feet. I'm going to soak them in the canal. Uh, if I was wilder, I wouldn't worry about that nut spender. Let him go. He's a cracked pot anyway. Oh, he's a little foggy upstairs, I guess. Hey, why don't you take your feet out of that canal, Biggs? I got to make coffee out of that water. Coffee? You call that stuff coffee? I had a motorcycle once that dripped grease that tasted better hey, than that. Wait a minute, Biggs. Hey, look over there. Where? By that bush. There's someone there. Hey, it's him. Hey. Hey, Spender. Spender. He's coming over. Why don't he stay lost, that crazy jerk? Hi, Spender. Long time no see. Hello, Cherokee. I've been exploring some ruins. Oh, you and them ruins. You're like a dog in a boneyard. What's the matter? Why don't you say something? Where you been? Up in the hills. What would you say if I told you I found a Martian? Oh, yeah? Where? Never mind. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you were a Martian and people came to your land and started to tear it up? I know how I'd feel. I've, I've got Cherokee blood in me. My grandfather told me a lot of things about the way they kicked the Indians around in the Oklahoma Territory. If there's any Martian around, I'm all for him. How about you, Biggs? They're dead. They're all dead. It's a good thing, too. Well, I found a Martian. Up in a dead town in the hills. I've been reading their books, and they're easy to understand. And I've learned their language. And then I found this Martian. And I brought him here, now. I don't see no Martian. I'm the last Martian. What did you say? Biggs, I'm going to kill you. Oh, cut it out. What kind of a lousy joke is that? Now, don't, don't put that gun away. What? You're kidding, huh? All right, Spender, you're... Ah! He's dead. You killed him. You can come with me, Cherokee. You're an Indian. You know how the Martians would feel. You can be with me in this. You killed him. You just, you just killed him. He deserved it. You're crazy. Maybe I am. But you can come with me. Come with you for what? Go on, get out of here, you crazy murderer. Of all of them, I thought you'd understand. I thought you'd remember what happened to your own people. You get out of here, you crazy murdering... Don't reach for that gun! Spender. Spender! Hathaway. 
break out the arms locker. Issue pistols, rifles, and grenades. Yes, sir. And you'd better get the Bible out of the navigation chest. We have to bury these two. Well, Proctor, you start digging a grave, hmm? How about Spender? We'll have to go up in the hills and find him. Just let me at him with my bare hands, a crazy murdering louse. That's enough, Park Hill. Man is sick. He must... Sick my eye, he's... That's enough. Now grab a shovel and start digging. Spender saw the thin dust rising in the valley, and he knew the pursuit was beginning. The sun burned farther up the sky and the blue sand drifted lazily across the sea bottom below. He sat beside a quiet pool 10,000 years old and held the silver book. Through the house played the strange wind music of ancient Mars. And he heard voices whisper in his mind. I hear you. I've always heard you. Even down there on Earth. No, I won't run. What's the use? Live, Earthman. Live, live, what for? To see them tear down your temples and put up hot dog stands? Run, 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 run. run, run. <sighs> They've seen me now. They know I'm up here. <laughs> There's Wilder now. I've got him right in my sights. Kill, 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 Earthman. Kill, kill, kill. Funny, he hasn't ordered them to use grenades. They could lob one right up here and blow me to bits. Yeah, maybe the captain thinks I'm too nice to be blown to bits. He wants my death to be clean. Just one bullet hole in me, nothing messy. And why? Because he understands me. The only one in the crew who ever did. Well, at least I can do the same for him. Just one bullet in his head, a nice clean death. All I have to do is pull the trigger and I... It's no use. I can't do it to him. Spender! Spender! Can you hear me, Spender? I hear you, Captain. What do you want? Talk! Truth! All right. Come on up. Leave your gun down there and keep your hands up. Oh. That's quite a climb. You uh, mind if I sit down? Huh. How long do you think you can hold out? Until you're all dead. Oh, why didn't you kill all of us this morning when you had the chance? You could have. I know. I got sick. After I started killing people, I realized they were just fools and I shouldn't be killing them, but it was too late. So I came up here where I could get angry again. Why did you do it? When I was a kid, my folks took me to visit Mexico City. I'll always remember the way my father acted loud and big. And my mother didn't like the people because she thought they didn't wash enough. I can, I can see my mother and my father coming to Mars and acting the same way. Anything that's strange is no good to us. We aren't fit to take over this planet, but to kill two men. How would you feel if a Martian spit on the White House floor? You know, you haven't acted very civilized yourself. Today. I'll kill you all off, Wilder. That'll delay the next rocket five years, and then I'll kill them too. And if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 60. And I'll meet every expedition that lands on Mars. Oh, I'll be very friendly. I'll explain our rocket blew up one day. And then I'll kill them off. I'll save Mars for half a century. And by then, maybe the Earth people will give up. And yet you're outnumbered. We already have you surrounded. In an hour, you will be dead. I found an underground passage that'll take me back in the hills, Wilder. I'll go back there. And then I'll pick you off one by one. We'll see. Well, it's a nice town you've got here, Spender. It's beautiful. I'd like to live here. You can. Join me. You're not like them. Why go back to them, Captain? I'll, I'll show you what a good life these people had. I'll... Oh, no, there's too much earth blood in me. I may even agree with you about all this, but that does not change what I must do. You won't stay? No. This is your last chance, Spender. Look, you're sick. Now, come along with me, quietly. No. No. One, one last thing. 
If you win, do me a favor. Try to see that they don't tear this planet apart. Right. And if it helps, just think of me as a very crazy fellow who went berserk one summer day. Be easier on you that way. I'll think that over. So long, Spender. Bye, Captain. Good luck. The men spread out again, walking and then running on the hot hillside places where there would be sudden cool grottos that smelled of moss and sudden open blasting places that smelled of sun or stone. The men ran and ducked and ran and squatted in the shadows. I'll blow his brains! Captain Wilder hugged the rock warm by the sun. He gasped, for the air was thin and not meant for running. Spender lay at the top of a hill, and a gap in the rocks showed the white of his shirt against the shadows. Wilder looked at the towers of the little clean Martian village, like sharply carved chess pieces lying in the afternoon. He saw the rocks, and the interval between where Spender's chest was revealed. Go on, Spender, get out. You've only got a few seconds to escape. Go on, get out of the caves. Come back later. Here, go now. I've got to win this. I've got to think that I'm right. And pull this trigger. Go now. Get out. I'll get him! A slug in the head, I'll blow his bloody brain! No, Puck, you! Put down that gun. I'll do this myself. Oh, Spender. Why didn't you get out? Why? 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 They buried him in that ancient valley town, where the music of the wind played on through the days and the nights. They laid him in an ancient silver sarcophagus with waxes and wines which were 10,000 years old, his hands folded on his chest. The last they saw of him was his peaceful face in the cold silver light of the racing twin moons. The captain found the poem in Spender's pocket, and he read it before he shut the marble door. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving, and the moon be still as bright. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. The next afternoon, Parkhill did some target practice in one of the dead cities, shooting out the crystal windows and blowing the tops off the fragile towers. Captain Wilder caught Parkhill and nearly knocked his teeth out. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you the Ray Bradbury story and the moon be still as bright, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Clark Gordon, Dick Hamilton, Nelson Olmstead, Lawrence Kerr, and Stan Early. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, minus five, minus four... Minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X minus one. Tonight's story, No Contact. It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the Great Galactic Barrier. In the past ten years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out, and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, at an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987 that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now hear this. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Well, Lewis, this is it. I don't suppose you'll be needing the ship's doctor up here on the bridge during blast off. I think not, Smitty. There's little chance of acceleration bends in these new overdrive ships. I'll be in my office then, counting vitamin pills if you need me. It's only a few steps. Good luck, Lewis. Thank you, Smitty. Uh, Lieutenant Collier. Uh, yes, sir? If you're relieved, you'd better get down to navigation control and take over. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? We've never flown together before. This is your first flight in a space vessel as big as the Star Cloud. Yes, sir, but I was trained in oversized jobs at the Naval Academy. Well, if you're half as good a navigator as your father was, you'll do fine. Thank you, sir. Did you ship out with my father? I served under him on one of the first rocket runs to the moon. I see. I almost went along on his last trip to the barrier. Um, too bad about that. Yes, sir. That's all, Collier. Paulison. Get me the ground control tower on the field. I want to talk to Colonel Harrison. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. I patched in the bridge speaker. Colonel Harrison? Yes, Captain. We're standing by for takeoff in 30 seconds. Good. The field's cleared of all personnel. We'll try to reestablish radio contact immediately after takeoff. In any event, there'll be a 24-hour ground monitor. Fine. Good luck. Hope you make it. Thank you. Bridge to navigation control. Have control. Call you. Huh? Ready, Lieutenant? Ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right. Stand by for blastoff. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 20 seconds. 19. 18. 17. 16. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? Paulson, sir. We've uncovered a stowaway. Stowaway? Where? Found Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room, kill your rockets and stand by. Thorson, this is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's a stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this base. What's the All matter right, with you? Captain, take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, takeoff can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take Don't to... bother for me for a while. I'm busy. Stupid idiot. Captain Thorson? Yes, come in, Smitty. Here's your stove. I'll eh? court martial. The... Oh, Charlie. Can you use a good radio man, Skipper? Well, I see you two have met. I met. Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Skipper? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They they turned me down. Well, what's wrong with you? Acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, Skipper. I, I got one more good trip in me. Listen, Skipper, you, you you know that these green kids, they don't know the first thing about space radio operation. Now, you, you put a man like me on and I'll, I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. 
Charlie, you know the regulations as well as I do. I can't take you much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. Well, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'll have you put aground. I'll tell you what, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact, and it'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. Well, he'd better. I'll have him busted to corporal for letting you sneak aboard. Look, Charlie, you... Look, you'd better be off. Uh, Paulison. Yes, sir. I'm sending this man aground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. I'm I'm sorry. Good luck, Skipper. I thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. If it had been anyone else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, he's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command when we began the regular run to the moon. And if he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Captain Dawson, Nav Control, call you. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, How badly are we fouled up? Can you recalculate the course, or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. If we take off in exactly 30 seconds, we'll need to correct for only a one-degree deflection. I can do that before we breach the stratosphere. That's quick work. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Positive, sir. All right, Collier. I'm putting it in your hands. We'll blast off on your signal. Bridge to engine room. Prepare to blast off on navigator's signal. How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. That's four, three, two, zero. We've intersected the course vector. Good work, Collier. Course is corrected, sir. We're ready to go into atomic overdrive any time you say. All right. Stand by. Yes, sir. Now hear this. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Withdraw your dampening rods. Fission chamber ready. Blast tubes cleared. All generators operating at capacity. Take it over, sir. Go into overdrive at the count of zero. Three seconds, Mr. Collier. Three, two, two, one. One. Zero. Zero. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. My compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit, and he was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Oh, thank you, sir. Start your gyros. Put her on robot control. All right, the bridge is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. You got us off the ground. You can thank young Collier for that. Chip off the old block. You knew his father? As a matter of fact, I knew him very well. First rate spaceman. Oh, is he the one yes, who. Yes, uh... yes. He was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Volta. Lewis, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Oh, your guess is as good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's a nit? How about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space? That the ships reach it and slip into another dimension. I think that's a lot of rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. Why do you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. And we know that it destroys our ships and crews in some way. There's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it, Lewis? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. The entire hull of this ship is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Now, who are you trying to convince? (laughs) Well, myself, I suppose. Lewis, you've had your share of glory. First skipper to reach the moon back in 1962. You could have retired. Why are you risking this trip? Five ships are missing. Men like Prentice, Margotson, young Collier's father. I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going to Volta? We haven't any choice, Smitty. We're in a race, the kind of race where men and ships are expendable. 
According to the Interspace Code, the First Nation to reach Volta can claim it. Well, personally, I want no part of it. Now, Doc... I'll have to play physician, morale builder, and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. And your morale doesn't sound too good, Doc. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction, it is terrible. And something tells me as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Well, I see they haven't court martialed you yet. No, sir. Thanks to you. Well, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. All right. Now, how's our signal? Strong. Clear as a bell. Now, here's our log report for Colonel Harrison. You ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running through. No radiation. Operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. How's the morale, Smitty? The men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. Well, how's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Ah, I was afraid of that. Are they bad? Same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. Eyes are sensitive to infrareds. Eh, I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blues. Well, now there's a theory it's caused by the terrific acceleration of atomic overdrive. Change in gravity affects the circulation. Hmm. What do you think? I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's just an occupational disease of space now. Uh -huh. You think it's just uh, nerves, then? Well, young Collier's got a bad case. I, I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not a panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Sir, I understand that you've relieved me from duty. Well, Dr. Smithson says you aren't looking very well, Collier. I'm giving you a rest. Sir, I feel perfectly able to continue. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. Captain... I'd like to remain at my post. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. You think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I, I, I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading policy? Uh, we're getting a plus five radar bounce now. Coming off the barrier almost as fast as we sent it out. What's the interval? Two seconds. Shortening steadily. This rate will hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right. Alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Uh, policy. Yes, sir? The radar bounces up to plus six. We'd better try to make final contact with Earth. Is Spark still trying to raise the base? Uh, yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. Huh? Seems to be some interference. Uh, that's the radio room now. Yes? You got him? Well, cut in on the bridge speaker. The captain will take it from here. Hello? Star Cloud to Earth. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. You're getting heavy static from sunspots. That's not sunspots, Charlie. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Getting a plus... No, a plus seven radar bounce. Expect to hit the barrier almost any second now. Good luck, Skipper. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece... I'll try to get back to you on the high-frequency band. Got you, Skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, Star Cloud. Must be getting awfully close now, Captain. 
It was bouncing back so fast, it's almost beating the signal. Well, when they go inside, hold on to your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Well, here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain. <laughs> nothing happened. We, we made it. We made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. <laughs> now, the, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They've earned it. Doc, can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can, Lord. This calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? It couldn't be better. How's yours? Couldn't be better. The... Condition red. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation, Radiation detected. detected. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation detected. Holy mackerel. Look at the needle on that indicator. Mollison. Mollison. Yes, I see it, Captain. Picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? Well, it's a strong impulse. What kind? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray, too short for UHF. Whatever it is, sir, the ship is lousy. Well, track it down, triangulate it, and make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is the fission chambers? No leak here, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? We'll keep at it. Paulison, how are you doing? Uh, I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? Well, I'll have to recheck my figures. Well, hurry it up. Angle is correct, but now, I... Come I on, don't... man, for Pete's sake. Where's the radiation coming from? Sir, it's... It's coming from inside the ship. Well, that's impossible. No, sir, I've checked it twice. Well, it's got to be the engines, then. If it is, sir, we're finished. Engine room. Yes, sir. That radiation must be in the overdrive pile. No, sir, it isn't here, sir. Are you certain? Yes, sir. All right, keep checking. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing this ship inch by inch. Yes, sir. All right, turn it on. Yes, sir. All right. Ready, Captain? We'll check the atomic guns first. Come on. We'll uh, cut through the officer's quarters here to ordinance. Now, turn here. Oh, wait a minute, sir. Huh? What is it? The signal's weaker now. Yeah. Let's go back. Hold it. Hold it. Seems strongest right about here. Well, it doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is this? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier? Oh, he's down in that control, sir. Oh, I'll try the door. Well, it's not locked, sir. Oh, it's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked, I'll sir. smash it. Oh, shut off that Geiger counter. Now, what do you make of this, Paulison? Oh, it looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufacture. I, I, I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Paulison. Get down to nav control and bring Collier up to the bridge on the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? Uh, I know a way. <laughs> Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with a transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? Oh, you know nothing about it. Oh, no, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir, unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? I suppose so, if someone had a key. I found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I meant a key to the wall cabin. I... I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, I... Uh... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? Well, I just assumed, sir. Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie. Having known and respected your father. Having observed the way you handle your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Paulison, turn on that Geiger counter. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter, how do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? Well, I... I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom were you sending those signals? Condition red! red. Condition red! There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approach. 
Alien spaceship approaching. Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk! Very well, Captain. My mission seems completed. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. Oh, what? The government of the planet of Voltan. You're crazy. Are you so stupid, Captain? Did you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information? Your language, your culture, family background. Yeah, your appearance, you, you, you look like... Like Commander Collier? Well, is that so surprising, Captain? You see, Captain, we had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish, Captain. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship now coming in water frame. I'll deal with you later, Collier Paulison. Yes, sir. Put this man in irons, take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Carpenter, Robinson. <laughs> Gunnery. Gunnery Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters. They're closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on the bearing. Fire. Fire, Richardson. Richardson, did you hear me? Fire! What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no what? use to shout, Captain. Collier, how did you get loose? Where's Paulison? Lieutenant Paulison is dead. All stations! Lieutenant Collier has escaped. Seize men! Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. Door line! No, Captain. Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. No? Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Robinson, Haley, report. You see, Captain? Captain. Carpenter! Robinson! Haley! It's quite useless, Captain. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. Very well, Collier. You beaten us. What now? The ship will be taken to Volta for, shall we say, further experimentation. I see. Of course, there's one thing you hadn't counted on. Just what is that, Captain? Listen! Carpenter! Are you in there, Lieutenant Carpenter? We can't all be dead. There must be one alive. Smitty, Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty, what have they done to him? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, dirty. I, uh, I, don't talk. No, I must lean, lean closer. It's not much time. Lewis, space blues. Space blues? What is it, Smitty? What are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues. Voltans. Yeah, hello, let me help you. No, Lewis, get message back to Earth. Voltan fifth column. Watch out for it. Please. Smitty. Oh, Smitty. Captain Thorson. Captain Thorson, you can't hide from us now. Come back to the bridge and surrender. Or my men will come and get you. Hello. Hello. Star Cloud calling Earth. Oh, please, God, let me get through before it's too late. Hello? Stark out to Earth. Come in, please. Come in, please. Hello? Hello? Stark out to Earth. Captain Thorson calling. Charlie, come in, please. Hurry. Hello? Oh, hello. Can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. 
God. Now, look, Charlie, listen to me. Not much time. Get word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Fultons. What? Fultons. Spell that. V-O-L. Fultons. That's right. They're from the planet Volta. Skipper. Skipper, are you all right? Now, Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now, listen. They have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You mean it? Of course I mean it. Tell Harrison, posing as humans. You can detect them by space blues. You got that only Fultons get space blue. Charlie, did you hear me? Space blue. I get you. They're breaking in, Charlie. I'm defending you. Warn everybody. Captain. They, they've opened the door. So long, Charlie. Tell Harrison. Captain. <laughs> Captain Thorson. Hello. Hello, Star Cloud. What's the trouble, Sergeant? I was just trying to raise a Star Cloud, Colonel. I had any luck? No, sir. No contact. No contact, eh? No, sir. Nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get a message back. No, sir. Neither do I. Oh, all right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, you you do that, sir. It's all yours. Right. Oh, and Charlie, uh, you better go out and get yourself some coffee. You look a little blue around the gills. Tonight, X-1 has brought you No Contact, written by George Lefferts from an original story of Lefferts and Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Captain, Donald Buca as Collier, Wendell Holmes as Charlie, and Bill Griffiths, Bill Smith, Matt Crowley, and Ken Williams. Your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week. When you want to take over a world, you naturally look for its weak point, some way to catch its people off guard. We live in a world where everybody loves a parade, a world of press agents and publicity stunts. But who would ever dream that invaders from outer space would take advantage of that weakness and actually hire a press agent to advertise their coming? Who would believe it was anything but just another publicity gag? At least, not until the terrible moment when it was already too late. The moment of... X minus... One. Our next broadcast was produced for syndication in 1949 at WMGM New York. It was based on a popular series of movies in the late 1930s and early 1940s and brought to the microphone the stars of the series, Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Ayers plays the young, idolistic doctor and Barrymore, ever in character, was the crusty, lovable diagnostician. The men worked at Blair General Hospital, one of the great citadels of American medicine, a clump of gray-white buildings planted deep in the heart of New York, where life begins, where life ends, where life goes on. We present to you Dr. Kildare on Hojo Radio. The story of Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trusts. I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my... The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer. Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Blair General Hospital, one of the great citadels of American medicine. 
A clump of gray-white buildings planted deep in the heart of New York, the nerve center of medical progress, where great minds and skilled hands wage man's everlasting battle against death and disease. Blair General Hospital, where life begins, where life ends, where life goes on. Dr. Gillespie. Well, Parker, what do you want? Uh, Sally just called, Dr. Gillespie. Oh, remarkable. You've got to get out of here and hide. From Sally? Well, Dr. Gillespie, what's been going on? Uh, well, well, she said a man came in the lobby and he has a machine gun and a violin case and a sack full of money and she couldn't stop it. Oh, it's too late. He's here. He... Is nobody here? In here. Hey, come on in. Oh, I beg your pardon, please. Uh, I'm Enrico Marziano and I look for Dr. Gillespie. Well, you found him. Uh, uh, put your violin case over there. And have a seat. Oh, tante grazie, grazie, grazie. I plan for a long time to come and see you, doctor. But I need eight months to work and to save so I can bring this to you. What is it, Mr. Marziano? It's a donar. Money. Penny, nickel, dime, everything. <laughs> well, gestures of this kind are always appreciated. Uh, well, what's it for? It's uh, for my wife, uh, Carmen. She's uh, very sick. And I un dolore. <laughs> Each week, uh, the pain uh, gets worse. My, all the time, uh, while I save the money, I think, when we go to the great uh, doctor, he will uh, fix. I hear the people talk about you, senor, and so we are here. Well, you are, at least. Where's your wife? Oh, she's away uh, down the stairs in the big room where we come in. She's uh, very sick, uh, senor. All right, Mr. Marziano. I'll examine her and see what we can do. Oh, mille grazie, signora. Mille grazie. Oh, by the way, Mr. Marziano, now what's in the case over there? The ca oh, that's my violin. I make a living by playing for the people in the street. A violin? Uh, well, I didn't know. I mean, Sally said that naturally I, I thought <laughs> I'd better go arrange a room for Mrs. Marziano. <laughs> Well, Dr. Gillespie, that's that. All this laboratory report does is confirm what we've thought for four days. It's a shame. Ah, uh, why do people do it, Jimmy? With all the publicity cancer's had, why do they still put off going to the doctor until it's too late? Well, in this case, Marciano apparently thought he had to save up the money first. Ah, money. If she'd been brought here eight months ago, we might have had a chance. But now, the money. I know. But no. we can't tell Rico that. No, no. No, no. He's crazy no. about Carmen, and he thought he was doing the right thing. We can't tell him he should have brought her in eight months ago. Oh, of course not. No, no. But we, we do have to tell him that his wife's going to die. Yes. Well, he'll be here any minute. How long do you think she has, Doctor? Well, you saw those x-rays. I'd say a week, could. Maybe two weeks. And that's about what I'd estimate. Huh? And we can't do a thing. Dr. Gillespie, Mr. Huh? Marziano's here to see you. All right, Parker. Send him in. Go in now, Mr. Marziano. Oh, grazie, grazie. Buongiorno, signore. Uh, morning, Rico. Oh, it's a fine day outside, the signore. The sun is shining, everything is bright, just like a spring. <laughs> well, maybe today you find what's the matter with my Carmen, no? Rico, you'd do. Uh... You'd better have a seat. Uh, some, something is wrong with Dr. Kildare? You, you tell me, no? Rico, I, um, uh, you've heard of cancer. Well, see, is that what's wrong with my calm? Yeah. But you will fix? You make everything okay for her, no? Rico, we can't fix. There's nothing we can do. My everybody say you take a Carmen to this Blair Hospital and, and nothing to worry about. They they fix everything fine. Oh, I only wish we could, Rico. But uh, this is one of the times we can't. Signore, I walk in here happy just like the bird. It's a beautiful day, and I say, today my Carmen is maybe get well again. But now... The sun and will shine. And I feel just like a dead man. I know. We understand. 
Would you like to go on up and see your wife now? No. Grazie, no, no. Because she, she look at my face and see the heart inside of me is dead. And then she asked, Rico, why this look? No, signore. First, I, I go sit in the park. I, I come back a little while. I, I really dare you. Ah, confounded. Confounded tarnation. <laughs> Morning, Mrs. Martiano. Oh, Dr. Kildare, buongiorno. <laughs> How do you feel? Oh, it's not too bad. This morning, I'm not thinking I'm alive here in bed. For one hour, I'm living in a place so far away. Uh, where is that? It's in Italia, in Napoli. I must think it's a long time ago. When I'm a young girl again. <laughs> that wasn't so long ago. Ah, you'll make polite to say so. But I have a son who's a go to college, Dr. Kildare. Why, I didn't know you had a son. Rico didn't say anything about it. Well, they're no get along so good. <laughs> oh, my Tony is a look just like Rico did when we were young together. <laughs> So handsome. Mm. Were you born in Naples? Si, senor. In the little house by the bay. And in the night, when the moon is shining, Rico is a come, and we walk on the road by the sea. And he's a play for me on the violin. It's so sweet. Always, he's so good to me. He's make a good life for us for many years. Uh, I'm not sorry for anything. Not even if I'm going to die, Dr. Kildare, I'm not sorry. Oh, now, what makes you think you're going to die? Uh, you try to fool me. I must think maybe Rico tell you to, huh? But I know. I'm a feel it inside. Is it true? No? Yes. Yes, it's true. <laughs> no feel a bad thing, yours. I'm a no afraid. It's only I, I feel so unhappy when I'm a think of Rico all alone. There'll still be Tony, your son. Maybe this will bring the two of them closer together. I don't think so. No, you, you see, Tony is a move away. You know, come home for two years. He's the thing we are. How he is said, old fashioned, old country. He's right, of course. But he should know be ashamed of his papa. Rico is a wonderful man. He's a great man. You want to know something, Mrs. Marciano? I think you're both great people. Jimmy, probably one of the hardest things a doctor has to learn is to keep his emotions separated from his profession. I know. Most of the time, I think I have learned it. But something about this couple hits me. It's hard. Yeah, they're fine people, both of them. With a rare courage and a tenderness for each other. And, and faith in life. They're a remarkable pair. And yet we can't save our life. No, we can't. Well, I've thought of a few things we might do, though. Small things, I guess, but better than just standing by doing nothing. Good. For instance, I've had Carmen moved into the best room in the hospital, one of the regent suites. I build the charges against the general fund. Excellent idea, Jimmy. I wish I'd thought of it. 
Well, there is one thing I was hoping you'd do. Well, count me in. Dr. Gillespie, I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, what is it, Big Ears? Well, Dr. Carew is here. He'd like to see Dr. Kildare. Oh, well, send him in, Parker. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It was. <clears throat> Dr. Kildare, I have been informed that you made a very irregular charge to the general fund. Oh, most irregular indeed. I suppose you mean Mrs. Marziano's room, Dr. Carew. Quite so, and it simply can't be done, you know. It's been done already. I think the fund can stand it this one time. It's entirely out of the question. Oh, don't think I have it my humanitarian side, too. But this hospital must be kept on a strict business-like basis, and I'm sure... Carew! I am amazed that the name Marziano doesn't mean anything to a great lover of music like you. Well, I suppose I, I, I do know a... <clears throat> Marziano? Huh? At the moment, it seems to... Uh, oh, slip, uh, you must remember the famous modern opera, La, La Burrasca? The one, the grand prize at the Paris Festival in 1924, as I recall. Huh? Oh, yes. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> I'd uh, forgotten for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Kildare and I were sure you'd want the wife of a famous composer like that to have the best, regardless of court. You're you're quite right, Dr. Gillespie. Yeah. I, I I didn't realize that this man was so fit, uh, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> that this was the same Marziano, I mean. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I have a great many things to do. <laughs> La Burrasca. You know, <laughs> it'd be remarkable if there really was an opera by that name. Well, Jimmy, let's go to work. We return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. Dr. Gillespie was calling him. Just a second. The commissioner's on the line now, Dr. Gillespie. Oh, good, 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 good. Here, hand me that phone. Hello? Hello, Tom. Leonard Gillespie. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Feeling younger every day. <laughs> How are those ulcers of yours? Glad to hear it. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to drum up business, Tom. <laughs> but I would like a small favor from you. I don't know whether you recall a violin player named Rico Marziano. Plays in the streets around town. Down... All right, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. There's another one, Parker. You can count him in, too. Well, we've almost covered the list, Dr. Gillespie. Yeah, 32 promises and a pretty fair list of names, too. Mm. Yeah, well, I can't think of anybody I've missed. I hope Kildare's making out all right. Well, he should be over there by now. Wayman took him at least 20 minutes ago. And ah, that... Parker, you idiot. What? You nearly let me forget the most important one of all. I let you. Well, uh, how should shut I... Shut up who... now. Shut you... up and don't start another argument. Just get on that phone and put a call through to the office of the mayor. <laughs> Are you Tony Marziano? Why, yes. My name is Kildare. I'm a doctor on the staff at Blair General Hospital. Um, you mind if I come in? Well, I... Thanks. You don't have me mixed up with somebody else, do you? No, I don't think so. You're a law student here, and you're Rico Marziano's son, aren't you? Yes, but did my father send you here? No. Neither of them knew I was coming. 
Tony, your mother's in the hospital, seriously ill. Mama? What's wrong with her? Cancer. It was all my fault. I had no reason to leave them, but I was mixed up and I didn't... I know. You grew up in this country and you wanted to look and act like everybody around you. They had their own ways and maybe people even laughed at them sometimes. That's it. Mostly it was Dad going around the streets with his violin, picking up coins. Raising a son by doing it. Holding the love and admiration of a pretty, wonderful woman. I know that. I knew it a week after I left, but I I couldn't go back. Pride, I guess. I, I... Look, Doctor, about money for treatments. Now, I'm working part-time outside of class hours, so I can no, help No, no, any... no. It isn't money your mother needs. It's to see you and Rico friends again. I don't know. Dad's got a lot of pride himself. He, he may not be willing to forget. Like to bet? I just hope he will, that's all. Oh, there's one thing, Tony. I said your mother was seriously ill. She is. In fact, she has only a few days to live. I'll get my coat, Dr. Kildare. I tell you again, I can't understand. Understand what, Rico? Well, look at this room, all filled up with the flowers. Everybody is sending of flowers and, and, and a telegram. Look, look at this one. It says, my sincere wishes for a speedy recovery for your, your lovely wife, your friend, Commissioner Tomas Avaril. But this man, I know see in my life. But that doesn't make no difference. He see you. It's just like I tell him, Dr. Gilles. My Rico is a great man, but he nothing so. Madre Dio. Ma, ma, still, I can understand. Who is it? Only one way to find out. Come in. Oh, Gilles. Hello, everybody. Uh, mind if I bring in a visitor? Hello, Mama. Papa. Tony. Oh, Tony. How are you, Mama? Oh, Dio mio. Before I had the heart froze with ice. But now you are come. I must start talk like the river at Napoli in the springtime. Tony, you speak with your father. You'll be friends, huh? Antonio. I, I can't find no, no words to say. Papa, I'm sorry. Sorry? But for what are you sorry? I, I said things I, I didn't mean. Oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. It's no matter now. What do you say one time and make me shame that, that I'm a nobody? And I, I can't forgive you. My now is a different. Look, my boy, look at this telegram. It's from a big people who call me their friend. Look, come on, you read. Read with me. This one is from the commission. The uh, last be speaking. You don't say so, Carew. Well, may maybe you don't have the right spelling of the name. All right, all right, all right. Meet me in my office in three minutes. I've got some telegrams I want to show you. Goodbye. What's the matter? Has Carew finally caught on? Pips, Queek. He's coming up for air for the third time. You stay here, Jimmy. I'll shove his head underwater again. There is simply no use whatsoever in hunting through any more reference books, Dr. Gillespie. There is no Italian composer named Enrico Mazziano. You hoodwink me. Hoodwink you? This man is just a street violinist, a mendicant. And you've kept his wife in that room under false pretenses. You and Kildare, between you, have deliberately... Carew! Shut up. Uh, I beg your pardon. Here. Take a look at these telegrams. Well, I can hardly see what telegrams could have to do... do uh, why, this one is from the mayor. Go on, read them. All of them. Well, I had no idea this man had so many influential friends. I believe we can stretch a point and forget about... Carew! You're a fool. Dr. Gillespie. Good night.
You know, you're the fine thing you do for us, the Dr. Kildare. You and the Dr. Gillette. We didn't do anything. Oh, this a nice room, all these flowers, so lovely. And this telegram, they are make my Rico feel big and strong again. But it's best of all, you bring my Tony back for be friends with his papa. It didn't take very much bringing. He was just mixed up, too proud to admit it. Still is good thing. Now Rico is... Listen. Is my Rico playing the violin? Yes. I guess he must be down below there in the street. Would you like the window open? No. No, I am hear it fine. Everything is so strange. It's like a long time ago... He's a play the same song in Napoli. I'm a feel like a young girl. And it's a springtime by the sea. It's a warm. And I'm a walk on the road with Rico. Happy like a bird. Dr. Kildare, you... You tell Rico I'm like the song of very much. Yes, I'll tell him. So long a time. So good a life. Oh, Rico, me. Rico. Come in, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, Parker says the Marzianos were leaving early, so I wondered if... Oh, when, Jimmy? Just now. Oh, oh that's too bad. That, that's Rico out there, huh? Yes. And I don't think he's really out there at all. I think he's on a road near Naples in the moonlight, serenading a beautiful young girl... A long time ago. In just a moment, we will return to the story of Dr. Kildare. Story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Yeah, what a session that was. What's the matter, Jimmy? Tough case this morning? Yeah, obstetrical. Turned out okay. Seven pounds, four ounces. Mother and son getting along nicely. Why do we do it, Dr. Gillespie? Why do we do what? Become doctors. Well... Last night, Carmen Marziano died. This morning, I deliver a new baby. Score, one to one. So what's it all add up to? Life. And death. Well, they're both counterparts of the same thing. What is that same thing? Well, now... The Society for Dealing with Profound Questions is now in session. Dr. Kildare has just asked what is the same thing. Dr. Kildare is a brilliant young physician and surgeon who was occasionally troubled by a hole in his head. And at such times, he thinks he doesn't want to be a doctor. All right, all right. The witness withdraws the question. Maybe I am tired. Last night hit me pretty hard, but when you come right down to it, I guess if I couldn't be a doctor, I wouldn't want to be anything else in this world. <laughs> You 
have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Dr. Kildare is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Malaya, starring Spencer Tracy, James Stewart, Valentina Cortesa, Sidney Greenstreet, and John Hodiak. This program was written by Les Crutchfield and directed by William P. Russo. Original music composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Supporting cast included Virginia Gregg, Jay Novello, Ted Osborne, Peggy Weber, and Peter Leeds. Dick Joy speaking. You're listening to Hojo Radio. Stay tuned. The story of Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trusts. I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my... The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer. Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Blair General Hospital, one of the great citadels of American medicine. A clump of gray-white buildings planted deep in the heart of New York, a nerve center of medical progress, where great minds and skilled hands wage man's everlasting battle against death and disease. Blair General Hospital, where life begins, where life ends, where life goes on. What are you looking at, Jimmy? You haven't moved from that window for 15 minutes. Just looking at the people down there in the street. Hmm. Wondering how many of them are alive because some doctor somewhere went through medical school and was there to help when they needed it. Wondering how many of them will have years added to their lives because of some doctor they haven't met yet. How many need a doctor at this moment and don't know it? Won't know it until it's too late. I wish it were possible to stand up here and establish some sort of contact with the man in the street. Why don't you just go down and set up a stall on the corner and examine every man that goes by? You're not in very good humor today, are you? What's the matter? Liver acting up again? You mind your own liver. Your color's bad. My color's excellent. You're seeing spots in front of your eyes from staring out of that window. If I could save one man's life out of each thousand that walks by down there, it'd be worth examining the thousand. Jimmy, if you don't have enough work to do around here, I can easily... Well, erect... I have plenty to do, and I'm leaving to do it right now. Goodbye, Dr. Gillespie. Nice to have seen you. See you around. Yeah. <laughs> oh, would you better take something for that liver? Get out of here! That boy's getting too smart for his britches. Get out of here and leave my liver alone. Well, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mm. realize you wanted to be alone with your liver. What did you barge in here for, Miss Nosy? I am only in here because Dr. Carew phoned out and asked me to tell you that he was on his way down with Mr. Pendleton. Pendleton? Vernon Pendleton? That's what I said. The Vernon Pendleton that's on the board of directors of this hospital? Do you know of any other Mr. Vernon Pendleton that Dr. Carew would consider of sufficient importance to personally escort down to your office? It isn't fair. 
It isn't fair that I should get Pendleton again this year. I got him last year. Well, I'm sure Dr. Carew wants him to have the very best attention. After all, Mr. Pendleton donates a good deal of money to this hospital every year. Spare me the gruesome details, Vernon Pendleton. The only thing wrong with that man is that he's in the last stages of being a hypochondriac. Come in! Ah, Dr. Gillespie, here you are. You remember Mr. Pendleton, don't you? No, yes, yes, of course. How are you, Mr. Pendleton? Uh, Poorly, Dr. Gillespie, poorly. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, oh. Well, where do you feel poorly this time, Mr. Pendleton? Well, I'll tell you, Dr. Gillespie. If you two gentlemen will excuse me. Dr. Carew, just a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Pendleton, is it your stomach again? It's my stomach, my back, my arms, my legs, my head, my... Exactly, just as I thought, Mr. Pendleton. Evidently, I wasn't able to help you too much last year. Oh, oh, I wouldn't say that, Dr. Gillespie. For a time, I may have improved. No, 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 no. I wasn't able to help you, or you wouldn't be back among us so soon. Now... Dr. Carew will tell you we have a specialist on our staff much better equipped to handle your type of case. Not better than you, Dr. Gillespie. (laughs) Dr. Gillespie is just being modest. Well, now, your type of illness takes a very modern approach. Oh. And I can't think of anyone better equipped to handle someone who was having trouble with his stomach, back, arms, legs, and head than Dr. Kildare. Kildare. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I... I uh, don't... His office is right down the hall. Dr. Carew will show you the way. I'm sure you'll find him more than satisfactory. Much as I regret losing you as a patient, I sincerely feel that Kildare is your man. Well, uh, uh, let's talk to Kildare, Carew. Mm-hmm. Very well, Mr. Pendleton. Of course, I don't know if he's in his office. He is, but... he is, he is. Oh. Yes. Then let's see him. Nice to have seen you, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, Glad to have seen you, Mr. Pendleton. (laughs) That was not very nice of you, Dr. Gillespie. After all, Dr. Kildare doesn't know about Mr. Pendleton. (laughs) I am a dirty dog. A dirty dog. (laughs) Mr. Pendleton, what seems to be the trouble? I don't know. That's what I expect you to tell me, Dr. Kildare. That's fair enough. And tell me how you've been feeling. Well, I've been feeling just terribly, Dr. Kildare, simply terribly. My stomach hasn't been right. And I've had terrible headaches and trouble with my back. And I've had a shooting pain that comes and goes in my left elbow. And my eyes have been bothering me. And and nothing I take for these things does a bit of good. You've been taking things? Oh, my stars, yes. I have a pill for my liver, a pill for my gallbladder, two pills for my headaches... Three pills for my back, one pill for my eyes, one pill for the shooting pain in my elbow, a half a dozen pills to help my general overall condition. And then, of course, I take practically every kind of vitamin on the market. Mm-hmm. I see. Very well, Mr. Pendleton. If you'll step into the next room and disrobe, I'd like to examine you. Oh, uh, whatever you say, Doctor. Uh. Come in. Oh, sorry. Are you attempting to establish contact with the man in the street again? I see you haven't done anything about that liver. Leave my liver alone. A man's entitled to some privacy. You're really in rare form today, Doctor. Well, I trust you're the same. How are you coming on with Mr. Pendleton? I thought you were supposed to take care of the board of directors. Well, I thought it was only fair to give you a crack at some of them, too. One for all and all for one, you know. I don't like the expression on your face. I'll quit harping on my liver. This is not your liver, it's your attitude. There's something that's not quite kosher about all this. Dr. Kildare, you have an ugly, suspicious mind. Yes? Well, I didn't have before I met you. I'm ready, doctor. Your patient seems to be calling you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Gillespie. Mm-hmm. My hearing is not impaired. Yes. Oh, and thank you for recommending the patient to me, Dr. Gillespie. The pleasure was all mine, Dr. Kildare. The pleasure was all mine. Good 
morning, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, well, you're early for your appointment. Well, Doctor, I don't mind telling you I had a frightful night last night. Just frightful. Really? Why was that? Well, I was so concerned about what news you'd have for me today. I want to tell you, when a man gets to be my age, things like this are very hard to face. Well, Mr. Pendleton, I have very good news for you. You have? I certainly have. There's nothing wrong with you. There's no... Would you mind repeating that, Dr. Kildare? I said there's nothing wrong with you. But that's not true. That's not true. My head, my stomach, my back, my legs, my elbow. I've given you a complete and most thorough examination and you're in fine physical shape, Mr. Pendleton. I don't believe it. You're wrong. You've got to be wrong. I know how I feel. How could I feel like this if, if nothing was wrong with me? I want a more thorough examination. Mr. Pendleton, sometimes people magnify and imagine things until they think they're sick. And there's really nothing of any serious nature wrong with them at all. Oh, and they told me you were a good doctor. They said you were better than Gillespie. Why, you, you couldn't carry Gillespie's hypodermic needle. That's quite true, Mr. Pendleton. Dr. Gillespie is one of the great men of medicine in this country. The rest of us, at best in his presence, can merely be students. Dr. Gillespie was always able to find something wrong with me. Oh, then undoubtedly he also cured you of whatever was wrong with you. Now, oh, you're in fine shape. Oh. Just forget about yourself. Take a few days rest if you can, and you'll be feeling fit as a fiddle. Well, I, I'm not going to take this lying down, you know. I'm going to Dr. Carew. We'll mighty soon see what he thinks about this report of yours. And you told me he was a good doctor. Well, he is a good doctor. Well, he told me there was nothing wrong with me. He stood right in front of me and looked into these eyes, these poor bloodshot eyes, these eyes that have suffered through endless nights. Just look at them. My, my. Well, what kind of doctors are you employing in this hospital? Oh, the best. The very best. Well, you may think they're the best, but I don't think much of them. If this is the kind of medical men my money is paying for, I'm going to take my support to some other hospital. No, no, don't do that. Don't be hasty, Mr. Pendleton. There must be some mistake. <laughs> yes, some mistake. I'll get to the bottom of it. Have no fear about that. I'll get to the bottom of it. Nothing wrong with me, indeed. I'm a sick man, mighty sick. Anyone can look at me and know that I'm a sick man. I can look at myself and know that I'm a sick man, oh, and I'm not even a doctor. Of course you're a sick man. Now, you go home and rest, Mr. Pendleton, and I'll look into this matter. I'll give it my personal attention, Mr. Pendleton. Claire, I tell you, you've got to find something wrong with Vernon Pendleton. But there isn't anything wrong with him, Dr. Carew. I've examined him from head right down to his little tootsies, and believe me, you'll go a long way before you find a healthier specimen. Oh. Uh, Kildare, you've heard of the school spirit, haven't you? Mm -hmm. They must have had it at your school. School spirit? What's that got to do with Vernon Pendleton? Sometimes things are done for the good of the team, for the good of the school. It's the old show must go on spirit, you know. Uh, you see what I'm driving at, don't you? Not so far. Oh. Uh, sometimes we have to shut our eyes to certain things for the good of the hospital. Sometimes we have to tell people what they want to hear for the good of the hospital. And it isn't always wrong, Gilder. Sometimes the things that people want to hear turn out to be the things that do them the most good. Well, I'm not going to tell a man he's sick when he isn't. No, of course not. But Mr. Pendleton has a big body. There must be something wrong with it someplace. Dr. Kildare. As head of this hospital, I must point out to you that Mr. Pendleton is a large contributor. Dr. Carew, look at all those people down in the street. There's a multitude there that needs attention, and you insist that a doctor waste time trying to find something wrong with uh, Vernon Pendleton. Well, at least pretend to. Tell him you made a mistake or something new. Very well, Dr. To... Carew. If you want to make a sick man out of Mr. Pendleton... All right, I'll play ball with you. I'll show you the old team spirit. That's the idea, Kildare. Now you're cooking on a Bunsen burner. Hello, Sally. Kildare speaking. Send out an ambulance to pick up Mr. Vernon Pendleton. And when he arrives at the hospital, I want him put into one of the isolation rooms. Have the driver that brings him here wear a mask. And don't let anyone go in or out of his room without a mask. Got that? Thank you. Well, now that sounded like action, Dr. Kildare. Dr. Carew, I wasn't completely truthful when I said there was nothing wrong with Mr. Pendleton. That's the kind of talk I like to hear. There is something wrong, something terribly wrong. And I'm going to do my best to cure him of it. Oh? What is it? What are you going to do? I'm going to give Mr. Pendleton the special Kildare treatment for hypochondriac.
return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. Did you have a good night's sleep? No. Dr. Oh. Kildare, why am I shut up here like this? Why have you got a mask on? Why does everybody wear a mask when they come in here? It's just a precautionary measure, Mr. Pendleton. Maybe quite unnecessary, but until we find out the nature of your illness, we can't be too careful. Oh. Now, let me have a look at this chart. Mm. Well, uh, what are you taking a precautionary measure against, Dr. Kildare? What do you think I might have? In the case of a mysterious malady such as yours, we can't tell without extensive tests. We have to keep you in isolation until we are positive that you are in no way contagious. Contagious? Oh, dear me. Ah, here's Nurse Parker with your breakfast. Oh, uh, breakfast. Good morning, Mr. Pendleton. Now, let me crank up your bed. Yes, you're having a lovely cup of weak tea without cream or sugar and a delicious piece of dry toast. I don't like tea and dry toast. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Pendleton, but that's all you can have just now. It's part of our first test. First test? Yes. After a while, we're going to let you swallow a small, soft rubber tube. And... I don't want to swallow a small, soft rubber tube. Well, I know it isn't very pleasant, but it's part of the stomach test, Mr. Pendleton. Uh. You are complaining of pains in your stomach, you know. Oh, uh, well, I, I, don't ha I don't have them now. Well, we want to find out why you've been having do I have to swallow a hose to have you find out? Yes, I'm afraid you do. Because through that hose, we're going to remove part of your breakfast in an hour and test it. Uh, my appetite's gone. I don't think I can eat a thing. I'm afraid I have to insist, Mr. Pendleton. But, uh, After all, you wanted a thorough examination. And I intend to be thorough. Well, yes, I know. You, you can be thorough and then... You can be thorough. There's no use getting carried away with this thing, nurse, is there? Nurse, nurse. After he finishes eating, I want some... Blood specimens. Oh, yes, Dr. Kildare. I'll be back a little later, Mr. Pendleton. Hope you enjoy your breakfast. Oh, breakfast. Uh, nurse. Nurse, this is the isolation wing, isn't it? Yes, it is, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, dear. I don't suppose many people leave these, these rooms uh, alive. Oh, yes. Several people have. Nurse, would you mind phoning my house for me? Not at all, Mr. Pendleton. And tell whoever answers to get hold of my attorney and have him come down here. Oh, your attorney? You want him to talk to Dr. Kildare about springing you? No, no. I want him to be sure my will is in order. Oh, you're not going to die, Mr. Pendleton. I'm too... No one could swallow a rubber tube and live. Now, well, it isn't that bad. No one's ever died from it yet. Of course, it isn't very comfortable. It really isn't much fun being sick, is it, Mr. Pendleton? <laughs> Don't ever give, give me another rubber tube to swallow. Oh. Now, Mr. Pendleton, Dr. Uh. Kildare wants you to drink this. Uh, oh, what is it? It's a lovely glass of buttermilk with barium in it. Oh, horrible. After you drink it, Dr. Kildare is going to look at you behind the fluoroscopic X-ray screen. see anything? I see peristaltic waves. You see what? Peristaltic waves. Oh, is that, is, that, is that serious? That's the contractions of the stomach. Oh, I feel worse than I did before I got in here. It always gets worse before it gets better. I'm going to make a new man out of you, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, I hope I live that long. <laughs>
How's your patient in isolation, Dr. Kildare? Have you found anything startling? Uh, not so far. It's absolute nonsense putting a man through all those tests. He wanted a thorough examination. He even went to Carew and demanded a thorough examination. Well, he's getting one. Uh, you've been giving him the works, huh? <laughs> Blood test, ulcer test, gallbladder test. <laughs> I wish I could have been there to see some of them. Well, if he was your patient, you could have been there. But you didn't want him as a patient, remember? Uh, uh, how is he taking it? Like a man on the last lap of the last mile. He's had his attorneys down twice, making changes in his will. Well, he's probably cutting the hospital out of it. No, no, that's the funny part. He says this is the first efficient examination he's ever had. May not be enjoying it, but he feels it's efficient. What's he getting next? Well, now he's going to swallow the rubber tube... With the metal perforated tip. No! <laughs> that is one of the most uncomfortable. Yeah, I wouldn't have the heart to do that to any man that didn't really need it. Well, how do you know he doesn't need it? You pass the rubber tube through the stomach to the duodenum where it remains. The duodenal juices are collected and. Well, kindly spare me the classroom lecture, Dr. Kildare. I don't need any refresher course. Well, then you know that this test will enable me to study the secretion of the pancreas, yeah. which plays an important part in Mr. Pendleton's digestion. <laughs> and it's his stomach that he keeps complaining about. You're going to do all these things, waste all these examinations on a healthy man. I don't think they're going to be wasted, Dr. Gillespie. I hope through these examinations to bring Mr. Pendleton back to health. Care to come along and have a look at the patient? I certainly would. Go ahead. Evening, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, Dr. Kildare. Why, you're not wearing your mask. Dr. Gillespie. Evening, Mr. Pendleton. It isn't necessary to wear masks any longer. Is it necessary? That's right. There's no longer any need for it. Oh, you mean you've given me up for lost. No, and I have no intention of giving you up for lost. That's right, Doctor. Keep fighting until the last. <laughs> he will. Mr. Pendleton, do you know what it's like outside? No. Oh, there's a snap in the air. When you walk, you want to put your head back and take deep breaths. The air is like, like November wine. I've always liked this time of year. I have a small farm in Connecticut. During the season, I like to... I don't suppose I'll ever see it again. You're going to see it before the week is over. Alive or dead? Very much alive. Mr. Pendleton, I've completed my examinations and tests. I know everything that a medical test can tell a doctor about a patient. I know what's wrong with you. Is it curable? It certainly is. Won't even be difficult to cure if you exert a little uh, self-control. Well, what is it? What is it, Dr. Kildare? Mr. Pendleton, you are the victim. Of what? Too many pills. The pills that you took for your elbow upset your stomach. The pills that you took for your stomach gave you those headaches. The pills that you took for your headaches upset your pancreas. In other words, you've been swallowing so much medicine that you've kept your whole system upset. Now, if you'll throw away the pills, you're going to be a new man. That's what I found out from all those tests. No more pills. No more pills. Not even one pill? No pills at all. Mr. Pendleton, I realize I'm depriving you of something. Yes, you certainly are. Ah, but he's giving you something in exchange, Mr. Pendleton. In exchange, he's giving you evenings to walk across that Connecticut countryside of yours. Days that you'll start out brisk and invigorated and eager to work. He's giving you nights when you'll sleep. He's giving you peace of mind. And in time, a whole brand new nervous system. Dr. Kildare's giving you back all the time you've been spending in worrying. To spend in enjoying life. Hmm. I know, Dr. Gillespie. Uh -huh. Oh, Dr. Kildare, you, 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 you've taken a great load off my heart. I thought these last few days, I, I thought I'd reached the end. Now, to know that I can leave here and, and go go back to life. Dr. Kildare, you, you've given me a new lease on life. I sincerely believe I have, Mr. Pendleton. I hope you'll obey my instructions. Oh, you have my word, Dr. Kildare. I'll never take another pill. 
unless you prescribe it. Then, Mr. Pendleton, I pronounce you cured. In just a moment, we will return to the story of Dr. Kildare. Story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Pardon me. If you're back establishing contact with the man in the street again, I wouldn't dream of bothering you. Oh, no, no, come and look. That's the world down there, our world. You and I and all the other men of medicine in the are all that stands between them and death. There's our world to protect, to heal, to care for. You know, Jimmy, you were right about Mr. Pendleton. He was sick. But somehow, it did that never occurred to me. Say, your liver must really be acting up. I think I'll take you downstairs and examine it. No, you. keep away from me now. My liver's fine. Couldn't be. This milk of human kindness comes from you only when your liver's getting very acute. My liver's all right now. Uh, that's funny. What's funny? Well, I really did feel a little pain in that region just now, but... Uh-huh. Confounded, you're going to end up making a hypochondriac out of me. Come in! Well, gentlemen, it's been a good day for the hospital. Gildare, you did a fine job, and I'm proud of you. Thank you, Dr. Grill. In fact, you did such a good job that from now on, we're going to send all the hypochondriac cases to you. Oh, no. That's a fine idea, Dr. Carew. A splendid idea. Because I never saw a man handle a hypochondriac better than Dr. Kildare. And speaking of hypochondriacs, Jimmy, maybe you better have a look at that liver of mine. <laughs> You have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Dr. Kildare is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Key to the City, starring Clark Gable, Loretta Young, Frank Morgan, and Marilyn Maxwell. This program was written by Gene Holloway and directed by William P. Russo. Original music was composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Supporting cast included Virginia Gregg, Ted Osborne, and Joseph Kearns. Dick Joy speaking. <laughs> Our next broadcast premiered in 1935. The program struggled in the ratings until 1940 when it became a national sensation. Within three years, it was the top-rated program in America. Few radio shows were more beloved, and few play as well half a century later. It was the brainchild of real-life married couple Jim and Marion Jordan and was broadcast to the nation from WMAQ Chicago. The show entertained America until March of 1956 and continued on NBC's Monitor until 1959. We invite you to join us at 79 Wistful Vista with Fibber McGee and Molly right here on Hojo Radio.
Boys of Johnson's Auto Wax present a new show featuring Rico Martelli's orchestra, Kathleen Wells, those two harmoniacs, Ronnie and Van, and starring that ambulating Ananias, that humbug of the highways, that Mary Fisher's motorist, Fibber McGee, with his constant companion and severest critic, Molly. Well, what are you doing, Fibber? Will you stop rattling that script in this microphone? This ain't a script. It's a road map. A road map? Yes. You see, this here map shows Route 42 and Route 16. Molly wants us to take Route 42, but she claims that 16 is more smoother, more straighter, more faster. Mr. More... McGee, come back here. Uh, I guess we'll take 42. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 42 for Route 60. Mark Kelly and his men find it all smooth sailing when assisted by those surf riding surfs from the surface station, Dust Off and Bright Sea. <laughs> down Route 42. Judge is six foot three. 
Now, follow me and no bunky business, yeah? All right. Uh, my, my. It's awful hot driving in July, ain't it, McGee? July? This here is April. Sure. In the 90 days, it'll be July. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Molly, ain't that serious? I tell you, that red light wasn't lit, and I'll plead this case till the cows come home. Wilcox, Harlow Wilcox. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. 
Well, anyhow, I don't think you're giving folks the right picture on the Johnson's auto way. Oh, I see. I suppose you could do it much better. Oh, ain't got the slightest doubt of it, my boy. <laughs> I'd make a kind of a story out of it, like this. Once upon a time, uh, but, uh, maybe, maybe I'd better have a fan player. Mr. Marshmallow. Mark Kelly. Oh, yeah. Upon a time, they was two kids, Violet and Ray. <laughs> you get it? Violet Ray? They don't get it, Molly. They ain't funny, McGee. <laughs> well, sir, there was never a dull moment with Violet and Ray. They improved each shining hour, you might say, eating the finish off in cars. So on Sunday morning, Violet says to Ray, Ray, she says, I'm just hungry to spoil the finish onto a nice, shiny car. Now, there's a bright, gleaming job down there. Come on, let's ruin it. Hooray, says Kay. Er, okay, says Ray. And down they come, right onto the nice, shiny car. But wasn't no use. After ten hours, they give up. Why, shuck, says Violet to Ray. We ain't making no impression. Ain't we got any personality anymore? And Ray just laughed. Look, says he to Violet. This here car's got Johnson's auto wax onto it. That's what makes it so bright. That's why we ain't getting nowhere for it. That's what you get, Violet, says Ray, for picking out this nice, shiny car. What do you mean, that's what I get, says Violet? <laughs> and Ray just laughs and says, for being so ultra, Violet, she says. <laughs> Fan player! Well, I'm glad to help you out any time, my boy. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you certainly spoiled my story, Fibber, so I'm going to ask Marcelli to give me time to think while he finds rhythm in the rain.
ladies and gentlemen, now that I've considered it, that story that Fibber McGee told you about Violet and Ray wasn't such a fairy tale as it sounded. Johnson's Auto Wax does protect your car so that the ultraviolet rays of the sun cannot destroy the finish. Wax actually saves the finish of your car against the onslaught of sun, rain, and road fill. Now, before you wax your car, of course, you'll want to take off all the old grease and dirt that's been collecting on it. The simple way to get that dirty film off is to use Johnson's Auto Cleaner. It's the easiest cleaner you ever used, and it positively will not hurt the finish. Johnson's Auto Cleaner will make your car bright as new, and Johnson's Auto Wax will keep it that way. Keep it so beautiful the neighbors will actually believe you have a new car. Drive into a service station and tell them to make your car shine like it did the day it was first driven out of the showroom. They can do it in short order with Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. Or, if you prefer, you can easily wax your own car. Thousands of owners are doing it. Just ask your regular dealer or service station for Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. And your dealer, by the way, will give you free a can of fine-quality auto enamel for touching up worn or rusty spots on your car. Oh, but more about this free offer later. In the meantime... I'd like to present Miss Kathleen Wells. And personally, ladies and gentlemen, I think the S is on the wrong end of that name because she certainly is swell. Miss Kathleen Wells. <laughs> Miss Wells. Miss Wells is going to sing. Uh, well, what do you want, Fibber? Oh, not you, boy. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Hi there, Sue. <laughs> What you going to sing for me? If the moon turns green, Fibber. If the moon turns green, huh? <laughs> well, you ought to know if it doesn't know. You're, you're a kind of a heavenly body yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Nipper McGee, come with me. Uh, uh, go on and turn it green, too. <laughs> Get up and walk around. Out comes tumbling through the ground. I wouldn't be surprised. Or oh, didn't you fall in love with me? If the stars turn blue and will that we begin to sing, winter changes into spring. I wouldn't raise my eyes. Or oh, didn't you fall in love? Charming as you thought I was hoping without any plan, but every hope came true. If the moon turns green and rivers begin to flow up stream, and this is all a crazy dream, I wouldn't be surprised. Anything can happen if you can fall in love with me. Oh, I believe in miracles. Honestly, I do. No wonder I get miracles out that certain miracles that gave.
where the vocal triangle finds that love is just around the corner. Oh. Well, sir, I left the Legion. Too many foreigners into it. 
But years later, I was here in New York one fall day, and I went in to get me an overcoat. In a rest? In a rest? No. In a clothing store. How do you do, Mr. McGee? Says the clerk, real respectful. I was well known in New York in them days. And still he was respectful? <laughs> well, well, what happened then, sir? Well, I'm coming to it. I want overcoat, it says to the seller. Okay, says he. Reach over to the rack. Here's a snappy number in camel hair, says he. And I looked her over. And will you believe it, son? Right square smack dab into the middle of the shoulder was a little oblong patch of white hair. It was Ermintrude. <laughs> yes, sir. It was Ermintrude back with her old master again. Shucks, I put my bust down. Oh, gee, that must have been a great moment. Sure. Why didn't you re to forget that, McGee? It was too late. Ermintrude was overcoat by then. Oh. Well, sir, I bought the coat. <laughs> I bought her and truth, and I wore her for years. It was expensive coat, and but I busted me, but nothing was too good for her and Trude. After, every time it got cold, I could feel her and Trude wrap herself around me real close. <laughs> and it snuggled up and fetched me like. She was like that, Ernie was. <clears throat> How much gas put him, boy? Uh, uh, five gallons. Well, give her another two quarts. Might as well have enough. No, never mind. Ah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to crowd the tank. How much owe you? Uh, Ninety-one cents. Thank you. Oh, by the way, huh? uh, whatever became of Herman Truth? Oh, dear. That was the sad part of it all. One day I got caught in the revolving door for Herman Truth's arm off. <laughs> there was nothing else to do. So I went out and shot the coat. Gentlemen, we'd like to tell you about a free offer. Yep, we... next week, folks, we're going to give everybody listening in a new car. Penny, make you ask for yeah, All you got to do... Hey, quit no. pushing me, Harpo. Not Harpo. My name is Harlow. Well, quit pushing anyhow. <laughs> well, Fibber McGee is just a little bit wrong, folks. We're not giving away any free cars. But with every purchase of Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner, we are giving away a 40-cent can of Johnson's Touch-Up Enamel. There's a brush right with the can, and it's a to touch up any little scratches or broken places in the finish. On your fenders with the body of the car. Now, there's a special introductory price of 98 cents for both Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. And you can get the can of Touch Up Enamel free. Better go to your regular wax dealer or service station right away with your 98 cents and ask for Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. Then, clean and wax your car the first chance you get and surprise your family with a car that looks like new. <laughs> Next week at this time, you have a bright and shining date with Johnson's Auto Wax and Fibber McGee and Molly. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. Present a shining half hour with Rico Martelli's orchestra, Kathleen Wells, Ronnie and Van, and starring those nutty nomads, those two traveling, truth sipping troubadours, Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Martelli opens the show with a musical weather report in March Winds and April Showers, with our Russian rhythm boys, Dust Off and Brightsky, singing the chorus. <laughs> Thank you. 
flowers, and then comes June, a moon, and you. March winds and April showers, romance will soon be ours, and I'll draw paradise for two. With your lips like mine, in a thrill divine, I'm so inspired, that I'll get you the moon for a toy balloon. Watch winds and April showers, make way for happy hours, and May time, June time, love time, and you. meandering down the macadam in that jittering jalopy, but Fibber McGee and Molly. We'd better be stopping for gas, McGee. According to the gauge, we've been running on a dry tank for 21 miles. That ain't nothing. Nothing? Nope. I mind the time I run a motorcycle from Cape Town, Africa to Mongabula, a distance of some 612 miles on a pint of coconut milk. You see, what I've done was... Never you mind now. You needn't be practicing your dime novels on me, Fibber McGee. Pull in that station then. I was just going to... Better get them briefs. Hi, folks. Yes? Ask him if he let you milk a coconut, McGee. <laughs> oh, shut. Sure we want some gas, young fella. All right, how much? Fill her up? Well, no. Uh, how far is the target still? 83 miles. And how far from there to Milltown? Oh, I'd say about 110. That makes, uh, let's see, 83 and 110. Oh, about 200 altogether. That's just about what I'd figured. Give me two gallons. <laughs> uh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, how, how much is it? Well, uh, the red gas is 18 and a half cents. The blue gas is 17. And the white gas is 50. Is that uh, the whitest gas you got? Mix up a gallon of blue and a gallon of red, mister. Purple's me favorite color. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, I hear there's a circus over in Milltown. You don't mean to be yep, that's why we're going there. I used to own the big elephant they got in the circus there. Name's Myrtle. Myrtle, the gentle giant of the jungle. Real sweet elephant, Myrtle was. Sure. <laughs> she must have read the poem. <laughs> what poem? Why should the spirit of Myrtle be proud? <laughs> Remember? Quit interrupting, Molly. This young fellow asked me to tell him about Myrtle, didn't he? No. Well, sir, I brought Myrtle over to this country in 1916. She was just a kid, man. Only 116 years old. Is that so? Yep. That's why I want to go see her again. See if that busted leg is healed up okay. Busted leg? Well, I never heard of an elephant breaking its leg. First case I ever heard of myself. You see, it was like this here. We was in the Wheeling, West Virginia one chilly day with a carnival. Find a chilly con carnival, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, the first day we had a, a street parade. A parade? Sure, <laughs> McGee parade, Myrtle wouldn't step on him. <laughs> Say, whose elephant was this? Yes, sir. We had bands, calliopes, animal cages, and 47 clowns. Including yourself. Including... No. <laughs> I was the elephant tender, known into the profession as a bull ball. <laughs> no argument. <laughs> now, listen, Molly, if you well, want to... Well, what happened then, sir? Well, sir, as I was saying, I always rid on to Myrtle Ted on account of because she was kind of nervous and scared. Particular was she is scared of mosquitoes and moose. Moose? Hi. Mouses! All elephants are scared of moose. I mean, mouses. Well, sir, there we were. A hooping down the main street there, and right into the main part of town, Myrtle stopped dead into her tracks. She'd have threw me if I hadn't been such a good elephant jockey. <clears throat> threw the whole parade into a ruckus. Lions was roaring and folks were shouting, and Myrtle, Myrtle, reading the signs, knew they was going to be riots. I never knew elephants could understand it. Understand what? Reading and rioting. 
<laughs> well, sir, most everybody ran into a movie theater till I could get Myrtle under control. Well, was there any damage done? Only to the truth, mister. <laughs> oh, not much. A candy store was wrecked when Myrtle went through the window. Funny thing, too. On her way through, she had four pounds of chocolate caramels, and we had a driller trunk out next day with a three-inch reamer. <laughs> but there wasn't much damage done. Fruit stand dumped over, three automobiles standing there, and, and two of them got scratched up. But the t'other one uh, had Johnson's auto wax onto it. <laughs> I kind of slipped that one in there, didn't I? <laughs> but Myrtle's leg was the main thing. Well, how was her leg injured? You mean how'd she come to bust it? Yeah. Well, you see, on her way out of the rear of the candy store, she had to go through a pool room. And that's how she got behind the eight ball, I suppose. <laughs> as I was saying, as she was going through this here pool room, she seen them billiard balls on the table there and give them a kind of a curiosity sniff, just in passing. And, brother, will you believe me? In them innocent little ivory billiard balls laying there, she recognizes her cousin Elmer, which had been kidnapped in 1678. No. <laughs> you don't say. I do say. Buster, in revenge for Elmer, she give the table a boot with her leg and snap. Busted the leg, right at the cow. You mean the calf, Lydia? No, the cow. It was too big for a calf. <laughs> so that's why we're going over to see Myrtle, boy. Uh, how much owe you? Thirty-six cents. Thank you. Uh, but listen, sir. You didn't explain what uh, confused Myrtle in the first place. Confused? <laughs> she wasn't confused, boy. Myrtle was just bubbling over with happiness, that's all. Sir, why, McGee? Well, sir, as the parade was going down the street, all the folks leaning out of their windows and waved their hands. And with all them palms fluttering overhead, Myrtle thought she was home into her own little jungle again. <laughs> Be seeing you, sir. <laughs> Kelly and his men playing Blue Room. And if we may digress a moment from Blue Room, Pink Pachyderms, and White Lies, let us tell you that it will be a red letter day in the life of your car when you give it a shiny coat of Johnson's. 
Well, Fibber, back again, I see. I thought you were driving over to see an elephant. <laughs> I was, young fellow, but I detoured off on the trunk line. Uh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> uh, I come over to give you a hand with the commercial announcement. Go ask Carlo. Carlo Wilcox. And oh, I can yeah. handle the commercial announcement all right myself. Uh, that's what you think. Folks, Johnson's Auto Wax will give you a nice, shiny sheen onto your chassis that'll shine like the sun when the shine shone. Uh, uh, I mean, when the sun shines on the teeny shine of the shiny... Folks, Johnson's Auto Wax... McGee, be... stick to your fibbing. You'll have to excuse McGee, Mr. Wilcox. He's been eating alphabet soup in the Greek restaurant. <laughs> McGee, why do you always have to... Oh, I can't have well, well, it may have been alphabet soup to fibber, but it will be duck soup for you to have a gleaming, protective finish on your car this summer. No matter how dull and dirty your old car looks now, Johnson's Auto Wax will make it shine like new again. No fooling. Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner work magic on any car finish. The cleaner is absolutely safe to use, quickly takes off all the old film and dirt without the slightest injury to the car finish, changes a dull, faded paint job to a bright, sparkling luster right before your eyes. And here's something very important. Johnson's Auto Wax saves the car from the damaging effects of the hot sun. The wax polish forms a tough shield of protection, so the ultraviolet sun rays cannot get at the finish to destroy its beauty. And now is the time to wax polish your car. You can do the job yourself or have it done for you at a nearby service station. Johnson's Auto Wax is for sale at hardware stores, auto accessory stores, and service stations. When you purchase the wax and cleaner, your dealer will give you free a can of black auto enamel for covering up rust spots and blemishes on the fenders or chassis of your car. But you'll hear more about this free offer at the end of the program. And now, we'll take advantage of the fact that Fibber McGee is not in sight to present that smiling little songstress, Miss Kathleen Wells. <laughs> Kathleen is going to sing every day. Kidding way, though I'm mighty, frivolous and flighty, honest I'm not fooling when I say every day I'll fall in love for love. Never let our love grow old. I'll always keep it new. Every day I'll let you know that my Valentine is you. We'll live the sweetest story for like honey. All over again with you. 
I'll never let our love run out. I'll always keep music makes the time fly. We really don't know how we do it, but here are Fibber and Molly McGee tomorrow morning, all ready to leave the tourist camp for the day's driving. Fibber McGee, where have you been? Huh? Oh, who, me? Well, who do you think, Henry VIII? Yeah, it's what? Don't be trying to change the subject. I want to know where you've been all morning. Do you think we'll get any place lying around the tourist camp all day? Lying around. Chucks, I was just telling some folks over there how me and Mike McGillicully built that there dirigible submarine yeah, and took it off. That's what I says. Lying around the tourist camp. <laughs> I got you there, McGee. Yeah. <laughs> now, where have you really been? Just over to the hot dog stand there to get me a hot dog. Oh, a hot dog, is it? Yeah. You got a pretty big appetite for hot dogs all of a sudden, seems to me. Well, they're real good hot dogs, Molly. Big and shiny, like they've been all polished up with Johnson. And never you mind the advertising. Okay, okay. But say, Molly, there's a real pretty gal behind the counter over there. Sweetest big violet eyes. Oh, oh what girl is it? And with big violet eyes. Yep. She... It's too bad she squints. Well, I'm ready to start any time you are. Well, that's lovely. You're ready any time I am. Yep. And I've been ready all morning. Check the tires, McGee? That's it. I kicked every one of them. How about that one on the off hind side there? Looks a little lumpy to me. If you put that new inner tube in wrong like you done... Now, with now, me... now, 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 Molly. Don't you tell me how to put in inner tubes. Wasn't I the fastest and best tire changer at the racetrack at Indianapolis on the 4th of July? They don't race on the 4th. It's on Memorial Day. Uh, of course. That's why they call it Memorial Day. In memory of me breaking the record, changing tires for Speed Mix Bud. Oh. Why, I mind the time. Never you mind now. I want to know about our tires. What makes it so lumpy? Look at it. Well, you, you, you know, Molly, we, we come over one of the highest mountains in these parts yesterday. And so what? Why, Molly, you, you know mountain air is bumpy, don't you? <laughs> Remember, I pumped up that there tire right onto the top oh, peak there. For the... And who told you that mountain air was bumpy? Air is air, and hot air is... McGee. <laughs> it's a well-known fact, Molly. As I was flying an airplane once over the Sangahoopas Mountains, the radio operator says to me, he says, Pilot, he says... Pilot? Uh, assistant pilot, he assistant says... Assistant pilot? Stow away, he says. Have you noticed how bumpy this here mountain air is, he says? And I says to him... Never, says, McGee, I don't ride a mile from this spot till I know for sure that that tire is all right. So don't be wasting air that might be needed. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll look at it. Uh, you wouldn't care for a hot dog, would you, first? No, I wouldn't. And suppose you keep your face out of the hot dogs long enough to face some cold facts. Chuck, I'd, I'd kind of go for a hot dog myself right now. <laughs> go on with you. <laughs> if you had three more of them things today, you, you wouldn't be able to set the car for wagging your tail. <laughs> now get busy. Uh, oh, okay, I, I just thought I'd... Uh... What was it you wanted me to do? Get some oil? No, forgetful. Check up on that bad tire. <laughs> you don't mean that bad tire. You mean the worst of the bad tires. <laughs> don't be stalling for time. Okay. Here on hey, you mean this one? Why, shut. It's as solid as the rock of Gibraltar. Gibraltar, Ignorant. The G is soft, like that tire's going to be when we're ten miles out on the road. <laughs> don't you worry about that tire, Molly. Baby, when I change his tires, they say change. Well, I mind the time when I... There you are, McGee. Can't you just smell the fresh mountain air coming out of that tire? Well, uh... Chuck's Molly, uh, I'll die now. Uh, I'll change it again. Uh, hey, Molly, where are you going? Where are you going? You stay there and get busy. I'm going to get yourself a hot... Oh, hey, Molly, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come here. What is it now? Uh, Chuck, Molly, I'm... I'm sorry. I, I didn't think that time... Listen to me, McGee. The idea of a man your age 
What do you mean a man my age? Why, shut. I can jump up and crack my heels together, can't I? Sure, but there's no use having both ends cracked at once, McGee. <laughs> well, anyway, nobody's no older than what he feels. What's the good of counting all of your birthdays? When the future has so much appeal. Why, it's the same on your first as it is on your 91st birthday. Take You're right, Miggy. You're just as old as you look and just as young as you feel. You. Oh, my heart is full of romance. When the grass is growing green, I may be over 60, but, but I feel like sweet 16. What won't be doing? when you think that you're Clark Gable, that fella on the screen. I may be over 60, but I feel like sweet 16. 16. I want to dance. I want to sing. I know it's winter, but it feels like spring. I'm not too old to have my dream. The world don't know me a gosh darn thing. Why, McGee, you're the life of every part. You betcha. You're a jolly jelly bean. I may be over 60, but, but I feel like sweet with a hey nolly nolly and a razzmatazz when I'm on a kitty party. I'm the youngest on the scene. I may be over 60, but I feel like sweet 16. I got you time. Oh, my friends are fat and 40. Still, I keep my shape so lean. I may be over 60, but, but I feel like sweet six. Weedy, 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 I have no weight. I have no pain. I'm not dramatic when it feels like rain. I've got romance in every vein. I spend all my evenings in lovers' lane. <laughs> you don't need overhaul the McGee. You're a darn good old machine. <laughs> I may be, but I feel like sweet six. And that was that, with a Hey Nonny Molly and a Fibber McGee, from which we go into a number by Martelli and the trio, in which the losers are all winners. Lost my rhythm, lost my music, lost my man. Take it, Rico. Uh, 
give, give me a fan flare, will you please, Rico? They, they, they's mutiny in that there band, Marchese. <laughs> listen, folks, me and Molly has got room into the back seat of our car for three of you folks that's listening in. All you got to do to apply for the ride yeah, is... Yeah. Hey there, clean old wax car, who are you pushing around? Harlow Wilcox to you, oh, and we... I'll take this announcement. Oh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you probably wouldn't even apply for that ride, remembering the state of Fibber's tires. <laughs> but you can have all the fun and none of the trouble by riding along with us every Tuesday night at this same hour. But Fibber wasn't fibbing in one particular. We are making you a free offer, and a lot more sensible one than his. We're offering you free a 40-cent can of black auto enamel with every purchase of Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. It's a very high-grade black enamel, which will successfully cover up all the disfiguring rusty spots on the chassis or fenders of your car. A brush comes right with the can of enamel, so you'll find it very easy to apply. Ask for Johnson's Auto Wax and Cleaner. At your hardware store, service station, or auto accessory store. The combination costs only 98 cents, and you get the 40 cent can of touch up enamel free. Remember, Johnson's Auto Wax will keep your car young and beautiful, protect it from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, and greatly increase its trade in value. rendezvous with Johnson's Auto Wax and Fibber McGee next Tuesday night at this same hour. Your announcer is Harlow Wilcox. I hope. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Our next broadcast was a radio series of mystery and terror tales produced and directed by Jock McGregor for the Mutual Network between March 18th and September 9th of 1945. Each week after the sounding of the great gong, host Philip Clark observed that the mysteriously silent keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind throughout the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. We present to you the sealed book on Hojo Radio. <laughs> the Sailor Book. Once again, the keeper of the book is ready to unlock the ponderous volume in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. All the lore and learning of the ancients. All the strange and mystifying stories of the past, the present, and the future.
keeper of the book. What tale will you tell us this time? First, I must unlock the great padlock, which keeps the sealed book safe from prying eyes. <laughs> now, what story shall I tell you? I have here tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, and of events strange beyond all belief. <laughs> there. Now let me see. Yes. yes. Here's a tale for you. A dark story of two brothers... One of them killed because he could not help himself. The other one was interested in murder, too, but in a very different way. The title of the tale is... The Hands of Death. <laughs> Here is the tale as it is written in the sealed book. It began in San Francisco on a night of thick, suffocating fog. A young man hurrying homeward turns a corner and bumps abruptly into a huge figure striding toward him. Oh, oh. oh excuse me. Fog is so thick, I didn't see you. It's all right. Uh, tell me, do you live here? Hmm? Uh, here in San Francisco? Why? Well, yes, I do. Do you know where Edward Morlock lives now? Why? No, I... No, I never heard of him. Now, if you'll excuse uh, me, but... Wait. But I, I've really got to get home. And... I just want a light from your cigarette. Oh, of course. Here, I'll hold it for you. Uh, just hold it like that. <coughs> uh, what is it? What's the matter? Nothing. It, it's nothing. It's my hands, isn't it? They frightened you. No, no, it's it, it's nothing. My hands, they disgusted you. No, no, of course not. They frightened you because they're not like other people's hands. No, no, no let go of me. I assure you that... I you ever... thought I was a freak. Let go of me. You're crazy. You... I'm not crazy, do you hear? I'll show you. No, no. I'll show you. <laughs> So, the Phantom Strangler is at work in San Francisco. <laughs> Jennings will be interested in that. I beg your pardon, <laughs> Mr. Morlock. Huh? Oh, yes, Jennings? Uh, the postman just brought this package, sir. Oh, package, eh? Give it to me. Yes, sir. Now wheel me over to the window. Of course, sir. Ah, this is close enough, Jennings. Uh, this package, I suppose you noticed it came from my agent in New York? Yes, sir, I did. Then perhaps you can guess what's in it. Eh, hey, Jennings? No, sir, but I have no doubt it's another nice addition to your collection of objects of having to do with famous murders, sir. <laughs> yes, indeed, a nice addition. But speaking of murders, uh, have you seen this morning's San Francisco paper yet? No, sir. Well, look at these headlines. Uh, read them out loud. Playboy murdered in fog. Phantom strangler breaks victim's neck. <laughs> then he's back. Your brother Kane is back. Yes, back in San Francisco, looking for me. And he'll keep looking for you. And if he finds you, he'll kill you. Yes, he's dedicated his life to that purpose. And all because he feels I cheated him out of his share of the money our father left us. Oh, it's a great pity. Yes, sir. Of course, we know the truth. Quite so. As you say, we know the truth. However, I hardly think Cain will find me here. No, sir. So we'll forget about him. Uh, Jennings, tomorrow afternoon, a neighbor is dropping in for tea. A neighbor, sir? Yes, Inspector Tennant, the head of the local police force. He's coming to view my little collection. Of course, sir. He may bring a friend with him... So have plenty of everything? Yes, sir. Well, that's all. What are you waiting for? Excuse me, sir. I, 
I wanted to speak to you about this check you gave me yesterday for my month's salary. Well, what about it? It's for the usual 500, isn't it? Yes, sir, but uh, you see, Mr. Morlock, I, I've been thinking in these times I ought to have more. More? Just how much do you consider your services worth, Jennings? Shall we say a thousand a month? A thousand a month? It's quite reasonable, I think. After all, if I were to tell the authorities all I know about your father's will and how it happened that the entire fortune came to you and none to Cain... Never mind, I... Jennings. I'll make out another check. Thank you, sir. But be careful you don't drive me too far, or you may regret it. Oh, I think I'll be safe enough, Mr. Morlock. After all, confined to that wheelchair as you are, you need me. That's enough. Go get your check later. Yes, sir. Very good, Mr. Morlock. So you're getting greedy, are you, Jennings? I must find some way to discourage you. Yes, some way to discourage you. <laughs> the next afternoon... Edward Morlock, the strange, crippled collector of murder relics, enjoyed himself thoroughly playing host to Police Inspector Tennant and Mr. Norman Smith, a criminologist friend of his. He began by showing them his latest acquisition, the one that had come by mail just the day before. And uh, now, gentlemen, look. Cashmere shawl. Yes, but no ordinary cashmere shawl. Until last month, it was owned by two very old sisters who lived in a dingy house in Baltimore. In Baltimore? Yes. You mean that's the shawl? Exactly, gentlemen. That's the shawl with which the two old ladies were strangled by a sneak thief. Well, I'll be darned. It's a prize worthy even of my collection, which is, I flatter myself, the most complete of its kind ever assembled. Funny hobby, I'd call it. <laughs> Every man to his taste, Inspector. Murder is your business, but it's my hobby. Now, if you'll just pull back those curtains there, the rest of my collection is on the shelves behind them. These curtains? That's right. <laughs> well, I'll be <laughs> jiggered. Uh, this is most interesting, Mr. Morlock. Yes, I knew you'd think so. Look there on the wall. An authentic headsman's axe. It was used in the brutal murder of the Baron de Morlay, uh, an ancestor of mine in the 15th century. And right there below it is the blood-stained dress worn by one of the victims of Jack the Ripper. And on the next shelf, you see... And so there, gentlemen... You have the highlights of my collection. How do you like them? Well, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, I'll say your collection does seem complete. It is indeed. In fact, there's really nothing missing except perhaps a murderer and a victim. What did you say? That the only thing missing from your collection is a murderer and a victim. <laughs> a most interesting thought, Mr. Smith. And after all, why not? Why not what? Oh, excuse me, Inspector. I was just thinking out loud. Oh. Well, I'm afraid we've got to go now, Morlock. Eh, hey, Smith? Yes, you're right, Inspector. It's been a great pleasure having you, gentlemen. And I do hope you'll call again. Yes, Mr. Morlock, you rang. Yes, Jennings. Before you help me to bed, I want you to mail these letters. Yes, sir. They are to major newspapers in San Francisco and contain a message to be inserted in their personal columns. A message? Yes, to my brother, Cain. We used to communicate this way in the past. But uh, what... uh, Here is a copy of the message. You may read it. If the gentleman with the unusual hands will visit his brother in Santa Villa, he will learn something to his advantage. <laughs> You're inviting him here? Exactly. You've decided to play safe. To trap him and turn him over to the police? Oh, 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 oh. oh, that's clever of you, Jennings. Yes, very clever. But you've already proved you're clever, haven't you? Now just take these letters out and mail them, and soon, quite soon, I think, we shall be seeing my dear brother Kane again. <laughs> ¶¶ 
For the rest of my story, the hand of death, as it is written in the sealed book. After Edward Morlock had put into effect his plan to bring his brother Cain to him, he sat in his wheelchair and waited, seeming much amused at some secret thought of his own. One day passed. Then two, then three, and then the newspapers carried strange new headlines. Next thing I read all about it, Phantom Strangler in Los Angeles, extra read all about it. <laughs> so Brother Kane was in Los Angeles last night, Jennings. Hey, he's getting closer. I shouldn't be surprised if he arrived here tonight. I... I don't like it. Oh, nonsense, Jennings. You know you've got nothing to fear from Cain. Unless, of course, you're so careless as to make some remark about his hands. I know, but he intends to kill you. I think I'll be able to control him. I want you to bring me a glass of milk. Cain is very fond of milk. Glass of milk? With a triple dose of sleeping powder in it. But I don't understand. Never mind. Just do as I say. What's that? I imagine that's Cain now. Cain? Here, already? Quick, I'll let him in. You get that glass of milk ready. And bring it in when I ring. Y yes, sir, when you ring, sir. Oh, come in, Kane. I've unlocked the window. Yes, I'll come in, Edward. Now that I've found you at last. Well, I'd hardly say you found me, Kane. Uh, I sent for you. It's the same thing. Now I'm where I can put my hands around your throat at last. I'm going to kill you. Do you hear? Kill you. Kane, sit down. Uh, what? Sit down. I want to talk to you. All right, I'll sit down, but you can't change my mind. Tell me, Kane, how many people have you killed since you got out of the penitentiary? Seven. Seven murders? 
They looked at my hands. They were disgusted. I didn't kill them. My hands did. You hear? I didn't want to kill them. But my hands killed them anyway. I, of course, I understand. Your hands. Your great-grandfather had hands like yours, you know, Cain. Don't talk about it anymore. Of course not, Cain. But you must be hungry. I'll ring for Jennings. He'll fix something for you. Yes, I am hungry. But please, Cain, don't startle the poor fellow. You know, he's very much afraid of you. Why? Why is he afraid of me? It's your hands. He says they give him nightmares. My hands give him nightmares? Oh, you mustn't blame him, Cain. He can't help it. My hands give him nightmares. Yes, sir. I brought you a glass of milk, Mr. Morlock. My hands frighten me. Oh, thank you, Jennings. Uh, just put it down here. Yes, sir. Uh, why are you looking at me like that, Jennings? Uh, I'm not looking at you, Mr. Kane. You're looking at my hands. They upset you. They give you nightmares. No, 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 Mr. Kane. That's not true. I'll show you. I'll give you a reason to be afraid of my hands. Mr. Morlock, help me. I'll oh, show no. you. I'll Let show you. Let go. You're you. kidding. Help. Oh, oh, oh. There. That'll teach you to be afraid of my hands. You can let him go now, Cain. He's dead. My hands, they've killed again. Yes, he's dead. Oh, you've been very wicked, Cain. I didn't want to kill him. My hands did it. My hands, you hear? You must be quiet now, Cain. You must rest. I didn't want to kill him. Here, drink this milk. Then lie down and rest for a while. We'll talk some more in the morning. All right. I'll drink it. I'll take care of everything. Oh. That's right, Cain. Lie back and sleep. Sleep soundly. <laughs> so, you would blackmail me, would you, Jennings? And you would kill me, would you, Cain? But I've been too clever for both of you. <laughs> Hello. Hello, police headquarters. Connect me with Inspector Tennant, please. I want to report a murder. So, there you are, Inspector. Cain was in the penitentiary for assault with intent to kill. Apparently, he escaped since then. He's been seeking for me, meaning to kill me. Good heavens, Morlock. Then he's the strangler who's been doing all these killings. Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, and I never guessed until he showed up tonight to kill me because he thought, you see, quite wrongly, that I had cheated him of his inheritance. Jennings bravely came to my rescue and Cain throttled him. Then I tricked Cain into drinking some drugged milk, and, well, there you are. But why, man, why? Why did he kill all these people? Because of his hands. His hands? Well, you saw his hands. Tremendously strong. Not hands at all, really, but more like demon's claws. Cain is morbidly sensitive about his deformity. When he feels someone is frightened by his hands, he kills them. Just like that. God, it's a good thing we got him at last. You can take him along now quite safely, but be sure to keep him well locked up, Inspector, and don't let anyone get within reach of his hands. A few weeks later, Kane Morlock entered the lethal chamber of the state penitentiary. Edward Morlock, the condemned man's invalid brother was one of the few spectators. Cain Morlock, with his last breath, cursed his brother and swore that someday he would be avenged. Then he died. The following day, Inspector Tennant and his friend Norman Smith paid Edward Morlock another visit. Oh, good evening, Inspector and Mr. Smith. It's very kind of you to stop by tonight. We dropped in to see how you were making out, Mr. Morlock. 
Thought maybe, what with the trip yesterday and the shock, that perhaps... Oh, no, 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 I'm quite all right, thank you. What must be, must be. You see, I'm a philosopher. You have somebody looking after you? Yes, Philippe. A Filipino boy is taking poor Jennings' place. Oh, and uh, gentlemen, that reminds me. I have something here that will interest you. Mm -hmm. Something that'll interest us? Yes, here on the table beside me. Uh, This jar. A burial urn, isn't it, Mr. Morlock? Exactly. And in this burial urn are the ashes of poor murdered Jennings. Jennings' ashes? Yes. You mean you're going to keep them with you? But of course, gentlemen. I was very fond of Jennings, very fond. What more fitting than that I should keep his ashes to remind me of his years of faithful service. Besides, well, I can always look upon them as part of my little collection. Your collection? Yes, Inspector. It was Mr. Smith here who pointed out that, complete as it was, it lacked both a murderer and his victim. Well, here are the ashes of the victim. Great heavens. That's rather a unique item, Mr. Morlock. Yes, indeed, an item any collector would be proud of. But the really choice addition to my collection is here in this box, which just arrived. Uh, Would you care to look at it, gentlemen? What in the world? Oh, now you needn't guess. (laughs) I'll lift the lid and... uh... See. Merciful heavens. A pair of hands. The hands of your brother Cain. Exactly. I can't believe it. But what is so strange about it, gentlemen? There are the ashes of a murder victim. Here are the unique and terrible hands that throttled him. Where in all the world will you find a collector who can boast such items as these? You must be mad. <laughs> Morlock, did you plan all this from beginning to end? Plan it, Mr. Smith. But how could I? You're quite mad. We could never prove it. You could prove nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Inspector, I think we'd better go. Yes. Come on, let's get out of here before I do something I'd regret. Call again any time, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Easily upset, weren't they, Kane? Upset by your hands. Your great, strong hands that are going to become the prize items of my little collection. The distorted hands of a murderer. <sighs> Ooh, how cold they are. And yet I can almost feel the murderous strength in them still. You wanted so bad that you close your hands about my throat, didn't you, Cain? But it's too late now. You're dead, and your hands are dead, too. Lifeless. Would you like to see how your hands look at my throat here? I'll place them there for you. See how nicely they fit around my neck. Just as if they... No! No! No. Let let go of me! Your hands! They're choking me! I I can't breathe! What is it? Where are you? Inspector, look. They're they're on the floor. Good Lord. It's Morlock. No. No, it can't be. His brother's hands had clutched around his throat. They've strangled him. (laughs) And that is the story of the hands of death as it is written in the sealed book. Edward Morlock was quite dead when they found him with his brother's severed hands about his throat. But they called his death heart failure. (laughs) For who would believe that two dead hands by themselves could wreak the vengeance that Cain Morlock swore to have before he died? (laughs) And perhaps it was heart failure. (laughs) Perhaps Edward Morlock... Thinking he felt the hands move, died of sheer terror. (laughs) You'll have to decide for yourself which is true. The answer is not written here. But the sound of the great gong tells me I must lock the book once again. One moment, keeper of the book. What story from the sealed book will you tell us next time?
Next time? <laughs> Are you sure you want to know? Perhaps my next story will be about you. For I have here all the stories that ever happened, and many that have not yet come to pass. But I'll find one for you in just a moment. keeper of the book. Have you found the story that you'll tell us next time? Yes, yes, I found one. It's a story about a man who found the secret of immortality, of life everlasting, and how he tried to use it to make himself master of the earth. The title of the tale is The King of the World. <laughs> be sure to be with us again next time. When the great gong heralds another strange and exciting story from... <laughs> the Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Thanks for listening to Hojo Radio. We have more classic radio coming your way next. <laughs> the Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book is ready to open the ponderous volume in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. All the strange and mystifying stories of the past, present, and the future.
Keeper of the book, what tale will you tell us this time? Uh, what tale shall I tell you? I have here tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds and events strange beyond all belief. <laughs> now, let me see. Yes, yes. Here's a tale for you. A tale of a man who stole by force the secret of immortality, of life everlasting, and entered into a mad adventure. The title of the tale is King of the World. Here is the tale as it is written in the sealed book. It is late at night and the wind howls over the desolate countryside. In the darkness, a man runs frantically through the woods, trying to elude his pursuers. I've got to shake him, or it'll mean a ten-year stretch. Stop, or I'll shoot! <coughs> That's twice they got me in the same arm. Oh, here's a house with a light in it. My only chance. If I stick to these trees, they won't be able to see me. I'm almost there. Here's a door. If it's only unlocked, oh, it is. Good evening. Now listen. Now listen close. A couple of guards from the Horton estate are after me. I'll be behind this door covering you with a rod. So you haven't seen me, you understand? I understand. That must be them. Remember, any tricks, and I'll start blasting. I have no intention of being foolish. Okay, go ahead then. Open the door. Yes? What is it? There's been an attempted theft of the Horton Diamond, sir. We chased the crook this way. Have you seen anything of him? Why, no. Uh, there hasn't been anyone here tonight. Well, we'll keep on going. Good night. Break on now. Ah, you did all right. Well, I'm glad you're satisfied. Hey, what kind of a place is this? All those machines, bottles and things. This is my laboratory. What are you, a professor? Yes, you... Right. Uh, hey, what's that? Hey, your nerves are on edge. It's only my great Dane, Caesar. Come in, Caesar. We have a visitor. Hey, what's he growling at me for? I'm sorry. He always growls at strangers. Don't like him coming towards me that way. Keep my way, will you? Come here, Caesar. He, he won't listen to you. He's going to spring. Well, this will stop him. Get him off. Take him away with you. Here, Caesar. Here, stop it, I say. Stop it. Yeah, that's better. I think I'd better put the chain on you, Caesar. Uh, did he hurt you? Look, I put three slugs into that dog. Why isn't he dead? He isn't even wounded. You must have missed. You say I missed him, do you? I won't miss him this time. Uh, I suppose I missed him that time, eh? Why isn't he dead? Well, the truth is, in this laboratory, I've created a serum that has the power to defeat death. I call it Serum L. L for life. You mean the stuff protects you from a bullet or a knife wound? In a way, yes. Swifter than the eye can see, it heals all wounds. The damage is repaired in a fraction of a second. Yeah. My serum is what protected Caesar. A shot of that stuff and you can't be killed. It sounds screwy, but that dog... Four slugs and not a mark on him. Look, Professor, I'm going to make a deal with you. A deal? Yeah. I'll let you keep on living if you'll give me a shot of that serum. But that's impossible. It hasn't been perfected what yet. What do you mean it hasn't been perfected? It saved the dog, didn't it? Yes, of course, but well, I'm still in the experimental stage. I don't know how long the serum is effective or the condition in which it leaves the body after it has worn off. You're wasting time, Professor. I'd hate to have to persuade you. I see. Do you understand the responsibility is all yours? That's all right, Professor. You let me do the worrying. Now, come on, let's have a shot of that stuff. Very well. If you roll up your sleeve. Sure. I don't try pulling a fast one, Professor. It won't be healthy. May I ask why you're so anxious to have my serum? Any guy in my racket who can take a slug and not feel it would be top man. I see. Just hold still a moment. All right, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all. Hey, my wounds. They're gone. Boy, there isn't even a mark on my arm to show where they were. 
I told you it healed faster than the eye could see. Yeah. It's like a miracle. Think of it. I can't be killed. Nothing can stop me now. I can move in on all the rackets and take them all over. Yes, sir, I'll be king of the world. Hello, Duke. What do you want to see me about? I'm kind of busy. I won't take up much of your time. I'm after a job. Well, I'd like to give you one, but I have a room for another man. You're wrong. There's one job in your racket that's going to be open soon. Yours. Mine? Yeah. <laughs> Duke, you've got a funny sense of humor. Yeah, I know. But this is one time I'm not kidding. You better be kidding or it might not be healthy for you. I don't have to worry about my health anymore. You'd better go while the going's good. I like it here. You're the one who's leaving. Right now. You haven't got a gun, Duke. The boys saw to that. <laughs> and I have. You're a little nervous, aren't you, Williams? Stay where you are. I'll let you have it. I don't scare easily. Not anymore. You ask for... <laughs> Couldn't have missed. I won't this time. <laughs> don't seem to be able to stop me, Williams. I shot you. I tell you, I shot you. Why did you fall? <laughs> oh. Oh, it can't be. I put six bullets into you. Why did you fall? Your gun is empty now, Williams. It's just you and me. No, don't, don't. I'll do anything you say. Stay away, please. <laughs> Too bad, Williams. You should have resigned when I gave you the chance. But you would be stubborn. That's what they'll all get if they stand in my way. Mike, come on in. <laughs> I'm just totaling up the take for last month. Going to be quite a haul. Ah, Duke, you're headed for trouble. You've been expanding too fast, stepping on too many people's toes. They don't want to get stepped on. They better stay out of my road. <laughs> they tried to bump me off a half a dozen times in the past month, and I'm still alive. Yeah, Duke, what is it that keeps you up even after they put a dozen slugs into you? Your job is to carry out my orders, not to ask questions. Oh, I, I didn't mean anything by it. I hope you didn't. Now, look, I want you to pick up a fast car. We're going after the Horton Diamond tonight. The Horton Diamond? Yeah. Ah, oh, Duke, that's suicide. We're cleaning up right here. Why risk our necks on a dangerous job? Because I want the Horton Stone. The way I got it figured, we can't miss. Remember, their guns can't stop me. Hey, you're sevening the best you can get out of this car. I got my foot down to the floor now. Hey, look at that diamond, Mike. Isn't it a beauty? Think of it. I got a half a million bucks right in my hand. Yeah, a lot of good it's going to do us if we don't shake that police car. Yeah, you're right. They're hanging on. We got to shake them. Uh, there's nothing more I can do. I'm pushing this crate as fast as it'll go. All right, look out for this curve. We're taking it too fast. Hey, I can't control look it. Look out. We're going over there. They must have been doing all of 70 when they crashed. Yeah. They'll sure have a hard time identifying this guy behind the wheel. What a mess. What about the other guy? Let's have a look. Say, there isn't a mark on him. He's unconscious, but he doesn't appear to be hurt at all. But he must be after a crash like this. Take a look for yourself. I tell you, this guy is going to live. Uh, a lot of good it'll do him. After killing two guards of the Horton estate, he's headed for the electric chair. <laughs>
And now, to go on with the story of the king of the world, as it is written here in the sealed book. Duke Farson, having been duly tried and sentenced for the murders he committed, is being strapped into the electric chair. <laughs> Warden, you're wasting your time. This isn't the last mile from me. I'm one guy you can't fry. All right, Richards, we can proceed now. <clears throat> Will you examine the body, Doctor? Sorry to disappoint you, Warden, but I'm not dead. But you must be. No man has ever lived through it. I'm not like other men, Warden. You can't kill me. Richards, unstrap the prisoner from the chair. What's happened must be due to a mechanical defect. That must be it. Hey, you look a little pale, Warden. Uh, it's good to get out of that chair. It's not very comfortable. But why are you all backing away from me? You afraid I'll hurt you? I'll just take this gun. Uh, that's better now. All right, Warden. Start marching. You're going to lead me to freedom if you want to live. <laughs> Me in, Joe. Quick. That's better. Hey, you look as though you'd seen a ghost, Joe. The papers are full of stories about your escape. They say the juice was turned on, and yet when it was over, you got up and walked away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I told him I was one guy too big to be killed. Look, Duke, I can't afford any trouble with the cops. You know I'm a three-time loser. Shut up. I'm still giving orders. You'll do as I say. The cops can only send you up for life. I can do worse. Don't talk like that, Duke. You know you can count on me. I'll do anything you say. Uh, you'd better. I'm going to hole up here for a couple of weeks until the heat's off. Meanwhile, I'm going to make plans, big yeah. plans. I'm bigger than just being the king of the underworld. If I organize things right, there's no reason I can't use the underworld to take over the rest of the world. Yeah, that would make me king of the world. Wouldn't be hard to either. Why is that clock so loud? I can't even hear myself talk. What clock? There isn't any in this apartment. Are you deaf? Can't you hear it? No, Duke, honest. I don't hear a thing. You must be imagining things. I don't know. I don't hear it so loud now either. Yeah, I guess maybe it was my imagination. Yet I could have sworn. Well, never mind. I got other things to think of. Big things. <laughs> Why don't you sit down, Duke, and take it easy? I'm tired of sitting. Three weeks in this rat trap is enough for anyone. I've had about enough. The heat's on as big as ever, Duke. I never saw them as anxious to get anyone. Every time I go out, I expect some dick to trail me back to this hideout. Suppose you let me do the worrying, Sure, huh? sure. I, I was only talking. Uh, have you been having any more of those attacks lately? I'm okay. Stop talking about it. It's bad enough without having to be reminded about it. I don't want to hear... Hey, what's that? What, Duke? That buzzing sound. It keeps growing louder and louder. I don't hear nothing. Listen, you must hear it. It's a fly. Yeah, and it's getting louder. I tell you, I can't stand it. Fly? Yeah. I don't hear it. Wait, there's one over there flying around us crack. Well, do something, will you? I can't stand the noise. It's driving me crazy. Take it easy, Duke. I'm doing my best to kill it. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, thanks, Joe. That's gone now. For a while, I thought I'd blow my top. Maybe you'd better see a doctor, Duke. You've been getting these attacks more and more these past three weeks. Uh, no doctor can do me any good. There's only one man that can help me. Who's that? That's the professor. <laughs> You, uh, you remember me, don't you, Professor? Yes, of course. I've been reading quite a bit about you in the papers lately, Mr. Farson. Uh, your serum was all right, Professor. It saved me from being electrocuted, but... 
I don't know, these last three weeks, something's happened, and I don't like it. Mm, suppose you tell me about it. I keep getting attacks. Maybe I'm listening to the radio. Everything's fine. Then all of a sudden, it grows louder, as though someone was turning it on full blast. Mm -hmm. It pounds on my head until I think I'm going crazy. Professor, I, I can't stand it. you you got to help me. You recall that when you asked for my serum, I told you it hadn't been perfected? Well? That I didn't know what effect it would have on the human body? Yeah, yeah, I know, but y you got to help me now. I, I can't go on this way. I keep waiting for the next attack. Each one is worse than the last. You remember my great Dane Caesar, don't you? Yeah, sure. He tried to take a piece out of my throat, didn't he? I'll open this trap door. You can see him in the cellar. Huh? Yeah, there he is, Mr. Farson. Well, what's wrong with him? Why does he keep whining like that? Caesar, too, received an injection of the serum, Mr. Farson, six months before you received yours. Yeah? Now, every sound he hears is a hundredfold greater. I'm speaking to you in normal tone of voice. Yet to Caesar, I'm shouting unbearably loud. You, you mean that... Caesar has passed into a condition where every sound is sheer torment. To be quite frank, he went insane three months ago. Oh. Well, why don't you kill him? Put him out of his misery. You forget, Mr. Farson, that the serum still protects him from death. He can't die. And is that... Is that what'll happen to me in a few months? Yes. I'm sorry to say. But, Professor, there must be something you can do. Maybe you got another serum, huh? Anything. I've got money. I'm sorry, but uh, it isn't a question of money. I can offer you no help. I can't go on this way, waiting for each new attack. And then in the end, if only there was an end, if only I could die. Possibly there is a way out. There is? Tell me. I'll do anything. Well, as you know, my serum can prevent death from a dozen bullet wounds. But there might be one way its great healing powers could be defeated. Yeah, which way is that? If you were to use an explosive, a powerful explosive, you might blow yourself up into so many pieces that the serum would no longer be able to defeat death. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. One of the mob once had an accident with Nitro. They never found a trace of him. Yeah. Yeah, Nitro. That would do the trick. Yes, quite possibly. If the attacks continue and they're beyond endurance, it may be your one way of escape. My, my one way of escape? Once I thought that with your serum... I'd come to rule the world. Now I'm looking for a way out of it. Oh, it's you, Duke. Yeah. You expecting someone else? No, no, of course not. What are you so jittery about? Who, me? Yeah. I'm okay. What'd the guy you went to see say? He can't help me. No one can. What are you going to do, Duke? There's nothing I can do but wait. Maybe maybe he was wrong. Maybe I won't get them attacks anymore. After all, just because it happened to the dog doesn't mean that... I... Hey, what's that? that? That steady pounding. It's growing louder and louder. Must be another attack. I, I can't stand it. It keeps pounding. Pounding louder and louder. Maybe it's the faucet in the kitchen. It's been leaking lately. I'll have a look at it. I can't go on this way. I tell you, I can't. <sighs> it's gone now, but there'll be another attack. And then another. The faucet was leaking. I just turned it off. Was that what was troubling you, Duke? Yeah. It's no use. I can't go on this way, waiting for it to happen all the time. And then ending up like that dog. What dog? Never mind. Get out the car. We're going on a little trip. Trip? Yeah. Where to, Duke? Upstate to the old hideout. I'm going to try to take the one way out. Duke, won't you tell me what we come to this old place for? You'll see. Come on. What are you looking around for? Nothing. No, no. Have you got the shovel? Yeah. Won't you at least tell me what we need the shovel for? You're going to do some digging for me in the cellar. There's something buried in the cellar? Yeah, nitro. All right, here's the cellar door. 
White Troll. You mean that's what's buried down there? Yeah. We stored it here for safe cracking jobs. Now I got a better use for it. You are going to get me to dig it up and be suicide. You saved this gun, don't you, Joe? You haven't much choice. Now start down those steps. But I can't see. It, it's pitch dark down here. That's okay. Just feel your way down the steps. If we get to the bottom, I'll light a candle. Don't. Please don't make me. Keep going. Duke, that was the bottom step. What about lighting the match? Okay, just a second. I've got one here. Uh, Grab him, Ross. I got his gun. I got him. Let go of me. Give me a hand. I got to reach that nitro. Let's go. Get him, coppers. Get him or he'll blow us all over. Ah, you rat. You squealed on me. Hold that light on him, Jordan. Hold that. Slip the cuffs on him. I got him. You've got to let me get to the nitro. It's the only way I can die. He's as crazy as a loon. Yeah. A place for this guy's in a padded cell. Farson, in you go. All right. uh, there. Uh, you won't be able to hurt yourself in that nice padded cell. All right, all right. And you won't be able to hear any of those loud noises again, no, either. No, no noises. There aren't any radios or watches or automobile uh, horns that can bother you in that cell. Uh, it's guaranteed 100% soundproof. Uh, <laughs> now be a good boy. Oh, you, you gotta let me go. I want to die, do you hear? You can't let me live and suffer these attacks. Let me out of here. Let me out, do you hear? I can't stay. Oh, it's starting again. Another attack. It's growing louder and louder. A steady pounding. Oh, it's my heart beating. Growing louder and louder. I can't stop it. I can't stop it. I can't stop it. That is the story of the king of the world, as it is written in the sealed book. Years have passed, but Duke Ferguson is still locked up in the padded cell. Day and night he begs to be executed, and yet at the same moment he knows he can't die, that the serum in his blood has given him immortality and sentenced him to a life filled with torturous sounds from which there is no escape. There is no escape. It is so written here in the sealed book. But the sound of the great gong tells me I must close the great book once again. One moment, keeper of the book. What story from the sealed book will you tell us next time? Next time? <laughs> what shall it be? A tale of madness? Of terror? of dark deeds in far lands, for I have them here, all the stories that ever happened, and many that have yet to come to pass. But I'll find one for you in just a moment.
And now, keeper of the book, have you found the story you'll tell next time? Yes, yes, I found one. It's a story about a ruthless man who put money above all and wouldn't stop at murder to achieve his ends. The title of the tale is Death Spins a Web. Be sure to be with us again next time when the great gong heralds another strange and exciting story from... (laughs) The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Thank you for listening to Hojo Radio. We'll be back again very soon. (laughs) 